What's up? Ladies and gentlemen, it's your boy, Omni Sensei. Welcome to What If I Was Reborn as Tai Lung, God of Kung Fu, Part 3. If you spot the like button watching his favorite anime, use your universal remote to change the channels constantly. Subscribe to the channel if you haven't already done so. Also, remember to check out the original story linked in the description. Without further ado, let's get into it. Tai Lung's POV using flash steps to fly across China was quite taxing for my body, as I felt my legs numb due to the strain. My chi reserves were also plummeting at an alarming rate, since I was not too proficient with the technique. But I pushed on because I could see the metropolis city ahead. It took me less than a day to cover the distance I took two months to cover by foot. Albeit I was in no hurry when I traveled on land. I used my heightened senses, my hearing and my acute sense of smell to observe the city ahead. The smell of iron and gunpowder was thick in the air. I could see huge smoke rising from factories and buildings, they were probably creating more cannons for Shin. I continued kicking the air and when I was right above the main entrance gate of the city, I stopped kicking and allowed myself to fall. Furthermore, I could have just entered the city and directly go to the palace but I did not want to risk anything before I got more information. For all I know, my students could have not come to the city, they could be on the run from Shin, or they could have been killed. I wanted to get some information first before barging in and falling into a trap. My cloak came off as I was falling from the sky but I made no effort to retrieve it. A deep frown graced my face, and my throat vibrated to produce low-pitched growls. V boom! I landed on all of my four limbs right outside the city gate, and the many guards stationed there gawked at me in utter surprise. My landing created a small crater in the dirt road and the shockwave sent small pebbles flying. My yellow eyes narrowed as I scanned the surroundings. My ears twitched to hear the many footsteps that came from other places, rushing here to check what was going on. My nose took in the smell, searching for the faint scent of gunpowder as I searched for any cannon stationed there. My eyes observed the wolf and gorilla soldier stationed ahead. I swiftly judged their strength from the way they held their weapons, their muscles and the quality of armor they were wearing. My sensitive paw sensed the ground, noting that it was made of dirt and it was damp. I should be able to move easily without any fear of slipping. All of these observations were done on instinct and in just a single second. My long tail whipped behind me as my muscles tensed, ready for movement. I stood up slowly as the guard still looked at me as if I was some illusion. The gravity of the situation had not quite settled in their mind. There were 13 of them stationed right outside the gate. Five of them were gorillas while the rest were black wolves. Soon enough, they shook their head and finally reacted to my presence. The biggest gorilla amongst them whom I assumed was the leader yelled out, Get him! The soldiers rushed towards me but before they could get close, I disappeared. There was no sound produced by my movement. The air was not displaced and there was no footprint on the ground. Flash steps. I moved at a speed untraceable by their eyes and when they saw me again, I was already past them and stood directly in front of the gorilla who gave orders. They all paused for a second and then a dozen of them fell on the ground, paralyzed. I had hit their never points even before they could realize what was going on. Thump! X-12 the gorilla who was the only one left took a step back in surprise. I let out my claws and sunk them at the side of his face before I brought him down to my level. He gritted his teeth but he was frozen in fear. He was too scared to even fight back as I looked him in the eye. Tell me, have the Dragon Warrior and the Furious Five came into the city? I asked with a threatening edge to the vibration of my voice. I expected him to give me an answer, but even if he did not, I have no problem with it. I chose him for a reason. He had a big body which meant more bones I could break and more muscles I could tear to get my answers. Lucky for him, he answers my question instantly. Yes, they are currently held as prisoners in Baoxiang Inn. His voice cracked in the end due to fear but I heard him clearly. Are they alive? Yes, all of them are unharmed. Lord Shen ordered us to no harm them, he said, even the dragon warrior too. I hummed at his answer before I delivered a swift nerve attack on his neck that made him fall to the ground limply. His answer got me curious. Why are they all held as prisoners and why did Lord Shen still spare them? He also said Lord Shen ordered them to not harm the prisoners. 
What is he planning? Is he trying to hold them as hostages against me? One way to find out. I thought to myself before kicking myself up in the air, and I made a beeline to the top of the Tower of Sacred Flames. I now learned that my students were indeed captured and held as prisoners so I could finally act. I flew across the ginormous city for a few minutes before I found myself directly above the tower. I flipped in the air and kicked as hard as I could to propel myself downwards. I crashed through the tile roof of the tower and landed directly on the top floor, which was the throne room. Crash, I broke through the roof and the clitter-clatter sound of pieces of tiles falling on the ground filled the empty room. It was dark and eerily silent with no guards to be seen. I would have thought no one was here if not for the presence I sensed on the balcony. I turned my head to look at Shun, who was standing on the balcony a few meters away. His back was facing me so I was unaware if he had any weapons but I was ready for sharp projectiles. I have been waiting for you, he said softly yet in the eerie silence. His voice was loud and it echoed. He turned around as his majestic wings and royal robes fluttered due to his action. His eyes confidently met mine and there was a friendly, almost good-natured smile on his face, which was something I did not expect considering how we met last time. Greetings, Tai Lung, we meet again, he said with a courteous bow, benefiting of an elegant ruler. I was thrown off by the whole thing, and I did not know how to respond, so I narrowed my eyes at him and became alert. You do not have to be wary, I just want to have a talk with you, he said, and your students are safe and under great care. Shin slowly walked towards me, his metal talons made a clicking sound as he walked, and they made me very conscious of the many hidden weapons he might have under all that feather and robe. I know you are someone who does not like to beat around the bush, so I will cut straight to the point, he said. I have a proposal. A smile benefiting the devil on your shoulder appeared on his face. Third POV Shurfu opened his eyes and looked into the horizon. He was standing on the top of his staff and meditating until he felt a disturbance in the flow of the universe. He had received the reply letter from Lord Shin so he knew his students were not in danger and treated as guests. So he wondered what the feeling he had was about. The wind suddenly picked up pace and a powerful gale blew on Shurfu while he looked the sky. The once clear sky was gone as dark clouds filled the sky. The world rumbled as a storm without rain brew above. Shurfu noted that it was an awful lot like the storm on the night Ugwe passed. When his master had said there was an accident. Whatever was happening, the universe did not like it. Shurfu was not sure but through inner peace he could feel it. The universe was throwing a tantrum. In the kingdom to the west, Monkey King snapped open his eyes to look at the sky above. His eyes glowed in his chi as he blinked once before he creased his eyebrow. Something was wrong. A similar scene could be seen happening across China, as everyone with a deep connection with the world could feel something was wrong. They did not know what, they did not know where, but they felt the distress of the universe. Tai Lung's POV I have a proposal for you, he said and stood just at the right distance. He was close enough so that we can see eye to eye, yet he was just out of my reach. The balcony was also open and right behind him. It was to be his escape route if things went south and I attacked him. I raised an eyebrow, a proposal? I sure hope it has nothing to do with ordering me around in exchange for my student's release, I said with a humorless chuckle. Oh, I won't even think of such things, he said with a smile. People say I am crazy, but I am not that crazy. So, then, what is this proposal that you speak of? I asked in an impassive voice without hints. Shun let the silence stretch as he stared me straight in the eye. He was trying to show his utmost honesty and sincerity in what he was about to say next. He'd have to do more than that to even pique my interest, though. And he did. He took a step to the side and started walking around me. With each step he took he came closer to my reach and each step took him further and further away from his escape. Now that piqued my interest. Maybe what he was about to propose was more than just one of his cunning ploys. I want an alliance, he said and I paused. Out of all the things I expected, this was not one of them. I half expected him to ask me not to interfere with his business or give me a threat. But an alliance? Now that's something I did not expect. An alliance between me and Gong Men City? I asked. It was not rare to see an alliance between a powerful master and a city. The Monkey King of the West was an example. He formed an alliance with a kingdom and became their guardian and in exchange, he held a high status there and got any resources he wanted. No, Shin said and stopped pacing around me. I want an alliance between you and me. That sentence had a whole different meaning behind it although they might feel similar. It means that even if he stopped being the ruler of Gongmen City, 
we would remain an ally. Naturally, I laughed. I could understand if he wanted an alliance between me and the city but between him and me? The audacity baffles me. Being in an alliance requires both parties to benefit from each other or share similar interests. I wonder what could he possibly give me? What would I benefit from working with him? Why would I even want that? I asked in genuine curiosity. He gave me a small smile before he started pacing around me again. I turned my head and focused on him as he said, because that way, we both would be able to achieve what we want. We? I asked, you think I want to start a meaningless war just because of your delusion of conquering China? You want a legacy, Shen said and changed direction. He started walking up to me ever so slowly as I stayed silent. You want glory, you want to be remembered until the end of times. Shen said with wide insane eyes. You want a legacy that surpasses even the likes of Ugwe, the person who locked you up and denied you what was rightfully yours. You want to be. He drawls and stops in front of me. His eyes pierced through mine and looked into my soul. More than a dragon warrior. My eyebrow relaxed as I looked at the bird in front of me. I did not know how, but he was somehow able to tell me exactly what I desired. To be the strongest and to leave a mark in the annals of history as the greatest, surpassing the likes of Ugwe himself. I can't be the dragon warrior. The universe rejected me. Destiny betrayed me. So I wanted to be more. I know that because we are not so different, Shin said and slowly walked backwards away from me. I wanted to surpass my great ancestors and have the whole of China by myself. I wanted to bring glory to the royal peacocks. And I wanted more power than any kings ever had, he said and raised his wings. But destiny won't allow me. My parents betrayed me. Hated me and I was burdened with a self-fulfilling prophecy that I have fought against ever since, he said. Yet I keep on fighting and I will continue chasing after that dream. If it eventually leads to my demise, then so be it. I would die trying, he said. He was a lot more different than what I expected. He was not the psychotic delusional bird shown in the movies. In fact, he was more like what he became by the end of the movie. The bird who accepted his own demise. The one who clings to his ambition to the very end. You said that conquering China was only a delusion of mine. He said, but it won't be a delusion if I have you by my side. He was awfully humble when he said that sentence. Shun in the movie thought he was unstoppable but after I showed him otherwise, he changed his arrogant and haughty behavior. At least when it came to me, become my ally. With your help, I would be able to conquer China and in return, I will give you the legacy and glory you always wanted. With your strength and kung fu, coupled with my intelligence and weapons, we would be unstoppable. I will finally have the control and power I always wanted and you will have the legacy you desired, he said. Together, we can both achieve our ambition. He finished off his speech with a smile. Now silence filled the room as I took in his words. I thought about it carefully and if I was being honest it was not a bad idea. The path you walk shall not lead to glory as you wish. Your quest for validation a failure, soothsayer's prophecy rang in my mind. I realized then that I was trying to follow in Ugwe and pose footsteps to achieve what I wanted. I was walking down a path not made on my own. I promised myself that if I was to be remembered, I would be remembered as what I truly am. Tai Lung. Not a hero, not a saint, and not even the strongest. They will remember me as Tai Lung. I plan to stay close to Pu and save the world when any threat arises. That way, I thought the people would accept me and remember me. I thought I would leave a legacy like that. But that path would only end with failure. On the other hand, what Shin proposed was a very attractive path. If I worked with him, I would have weapons and armies by my side. I wouldn't have to worry about armies which can overwhelm me and defeat me. Not only that, the best place to grow stronger was by fighting. What better chance to fight than in wars? If I wanted to get strong enough to defeat Kai before he returns, it was only right that I take a path that could make me stronger. So, you believe I will be able to achieve my ambition by conquering China with you? I asked and Shin smiled. He asked me one question that immediately caught my attention and directed my mind to uncharted territory. Why stop there? I have never said this out loud before because people were already calling me crazy for wanting to conquer China but the truth is, he said and opened his wings to show his majesty. I want to conquer the world, he said and his pupils dilated, burning with madness. He was even crazier than I thought. But what an interesting idea. I can't help but like the idea of conquering the world. The names of great figures from my past life came to mind. 
Alexander the Great, Genghis Khan, Napoleon Bonaparte, Julius Caesar, Cyrus, etc. All of them were great conquerors who wanted to rule over the world. History never forgot their names, even if they failed to truly conquer the world. If I were to do the same, surely I would leave a legacy that surpassed Uguay's whose influence stretched only to the landscape of China. To try and conquer the world. I have never even thought of that before because it was an impossible feat to achieve alone, no matter how strong I became. Even if I could become strong enough to defeat kingdoms, governing that much territory was not an easy feat it would require a royalty who was taught from a young age and with the necessary education. I would also never be able to sit around and rule a kingdom. I was made to fight not to govern, but with Shin. It became a possibility. I did not have to worry about all the politics or governing, I could just take territories and put him as the ruler to manage it. I turned on my heel and slowly walked towards the balcony while I was busy in thought. I could see the sky darkening and storm clouds were rolling in the sky. Kachang. A flash of light cracked between the clouds, and a deafening thunder shook the sky. I stood at the balcony and the intense gale blew on my fur, foretelling a storm. The universe was in distress. So, what do you think? Shin asked as he slowly approached me from behind. If you need more time to think, then you can have all the time you want. He finally stood by my side and I gave him a side eye. I don't need time. I accept your proposal. It seems interesting. The sky rumbled and lighting struck the world. The universe cried as two villains once wronged by fate and destiny decided to join forces. The universe could not right the wrongs. The accident escalates. It was not just China this time. The world was not prepared for the storm that is approaching. Tai Lung's POV. I accept your proposal. It seems interesting. I said and Shen was oddly surprised at my answer. Really? Just like that? He asked me with a raised eyebrow. I thought I would have to do more to convince you. I am not clueless like most warriors, Shin. I can see how an alliance could benefit me even without you having to name them one by one. I said with a scoff. What I am more interested in is how you plan to proceed after this. To be completely honest with you, I didn't think this far ahead. He said with light chuckles. You could tell that he was absolutely ecstatic at the moment. I thought, even if I did not fail, you would at least take a few days to think about my proposal. He said and waved his wing. That was not a meaningless action. As I saw all of the cannons which were aiming at the tower from a distance lower their aim. It was the same thing that happened in the movie. He was willing to bring the down tower in hopes of killing me if things went wrong. I knew he wouldn't have confronted me without any preparation. That means if things went wrong and I kill him, he was determined to at least bring me down with him. Truly a mad bird. But after our alliance is declared officially, I plan to appoint you as the supreme general of my army. You will have all of my soldiers under your command and you will also be responsible for training them, Shin said. A general. Heh. My lips stretched into a smile as the prospect felt a little silly. After all the talk I had about not following Ugwe's footsteps, I seemed to do the opposite and follow behind him. I remember Ugwe also used to lead armies when he was young. And your plan on how to defeat the other kingdoms? I asked and Shin shook his head with a smile. It doesn't matter anymore after I have you by my side. No one can stand in our way, he said. You have quite the confidence in my strength, don't you? Of course, I have seen it with my own eyes. And after we conquer China, then what? Then we wait, Shun said. We gather our resources and unite the kingdoms before we begin our conquest. Do you think it would be that easy? No. I know there would be problems and challenges along the way but two things gave me confidence. He said, the rest of the world do not have any clue on what gunpowder even is, they do not have dynamite or fireworks, much less something similar to my weapons, and kung fu is not widespread like it is in China. The rest of the world lacks powerful warriors and masters, although I have discovered that they have other forms of combat, it is ultimately inferior to Kung Fu. He said, In a sense, I think it would be easier than uniting China. I hummed at his words, although I did not agree. There was no way the rest of the world would be weaker than China. Although Kung Fu may not be practiced like it is in China, I was sure that there would be powerhouses around the world. Of course, they wouldn't be able to match me, but they won't be pushovers. I looked at the horizon. The storm clouds were slowly retreating. It goes as quickly as it suddenly comes. I looked around the city below us and I touched the fence surrounding the balcony. A weird memory came into my mind at that moment of seriousness. Hey, do you remember the time I pushed you off this balcony? I asked and turned towards him. He paused for a few seconds, recalling the memory before he quickly took steps back. 
Why do you bring up such unpleasant memories? You said you could fly. You knew I couldn't. He hissed at me. Although we were not exactly friends, we were the same age and were often forced to spend time together whenever we visited Gongmen City. He was always arrogant and haughty when he was a kid and after getting annoyed, I insulted him by calling him a bird who can't even fly. He took great offense in that and claimed he could fly. In the end, like I said, I pushed him off this very same balcony to give him a chance to prove his words. He did not fly, but that was the day he learned how to glide. Your students are in Baoxiang and located in the Noble District. They must be waiting for you. Since we are done here, you should leave. He said, I shall summon you when the time is right to get into more details about our alliance. I smirked at him before jumping off the balcony and I headed towards the inn to finally meet my students again after nearly three months. Third Povishin remained on the balcony for a long time even after Tai Lung had gone to meet his students. He watched the city below with a permanent smirk on his face, as if everything was going exactly according to plan. Eventually, someone came to disturb his peace. Soothsayer walked up to him. Her cane and footsteps made a clanking nose in the silent tower. So he agreed, Soothsayer said and stopped right behind Shin. He turned around to look at her with a victorious smirk. He did. Are you serious about this? Or is it just one of your cunning tricks to destroy your enemies? Soothsayer asked with eyes narrowed with curiosity. Shin chuckled. There are no tricks this time. No amount of trickery or manipulation would benefit me more than an honest alliance. So you really plan to work together. You are willing to share the glory with him or, more likely than not, get outshined. Soothsayer asked. She laughed. Yes. I figured the whole world was big enough to share between two people. I will have the power and control I always desired and he can have the glory and legacy he wanted. So it's not just China anymore but the whole world, huh? Soothsayer said in a calm voice, The cup you wish to fill is made of greed shin. It has no bottom. You don't know that. You don't know me. Maybe not. But your parents. She said but was cut off by shin. My parents hated me. Shin said in a heartbreaking voice, they wronged me, he said. His parents had always promised him the throne and all of the glory and power it holds. They promised he will be the great ruler of Gongmen City, the one who would bring the city to height never before seen. He had worked to do just that all his life. Yet in the end, they banished him and stripped him away of that promise. In a way, it was similar to how Tai Lung was promised to be the dragon warrior, only to be denied in the end. It was because of this promise and the sense of responsibility to achieve great things that he did not see the beautiful colors in the fireworks. He only saw the explosion, and his parents hated him for seeing the explosions. He still remembered the eyes of disappointment and disgust they threw at him when he excitedly showed what else he could do with the fireworks. They looked at him like a monster. He just wanted to help, he just wanted to fulfill his responsibility, he just wanted to show them who he really was. Well, they saw him, they hated him. He had heard of great kings conquering and defeating other kingdoms. They expanded their territory and established an unquestionable rule of power. Shin thought his parent would be proud if he had done the same. But no. He still remembered the night of his banishment. When he came home after massacring the Panda Village, he thought they would praise him for defying destiny and for breaking the prophecy. But the looks they gave him, the curses that left her mother's beak and the words his father spit at him, disowning him, it sticks in his mind forever. The scars. I will make it right. Shun said with a voice filled with psychotic determination. Shun felt so wronged because he thought he was so right. His methods were correct and he would prove it to his parents by conquering not just China but the world as well. Do you think, then, you would finally be happy? Will you finally be healed? Soothsayer asked before the silence stretched too long. Scars don't heal, wounds do. Shun rebuked, but yes. After I have China and the whole world under me, I will be happy. Soothsayer stills and stares at the hatchling which she had watched grow into what he is now. She then turned around and walked away, but not before leaving her final words. You are right, scars don't heal, she said, they fade. And happiness is not a destination, it's a direction. Are you happy with what you are now and what you are doing? She did not wait for an answer but walked away from Shun, leaving him to watch her back as he contemplated her words. Shun was not happy with he is or what he was doing. He could not let go of his past, and he remained hurt forever, and he hoped the future would magically be better for him. He can never learn to accept the present. Lord Shin, the bird who could never let go. Third POV, we need to act fast and complete our mission. 
We must find out more about the weapon and report back to Master Shurfu, Tigress said to her fellow prisoners in a serious voice. They were currently in the largest suite of Baoxiang Inn, held as prisoners of war, with every exit tightly guarded by guerrilla soldiers. As the name would suggest, the suite they were in was built with all the luxury that ancient China could afford. So the Furious Five and Po were enjoying their stay, even if they were prisoners in name. Are you even listening to me? Tigress asked with a helpless sigh as she watched her fellow students enjoying the luxury they were given. Monkey was sleeping lazily on a hammock and he was using bananas instead of a blanket to cover himself. Viper was currently receiving a massage from a small and nimble rabbit that cracked and adjusted her spin, much to her comfort. Crane was standing in one corner and was surrounded by different books of novels. He was contently reading them while plugging his ears so he did not hear what Tigress said at all. Mantis sat on top of Crane's hat, idly reading the book as well, since it was about romance. Pa was a little further away from them and he was eating from the table which was filled with different dishes from all across China. They were made by different chefs, and Pa didn't forget to ask or the recipes of any dishes he liked more than the others. Guys! Tigress yelled out and finally caught the attention of everyone in the room. They looked at her with questioning eyes. We can't just stay here forever and simply wait to be rescued. We have to do something, she said in frustration. It felt like she was the only one taking the mission seriously, while her friends were easily distracted by everything Lord Shin threw at them. Um, I mean, what else are we supposed to do? Mantis asked with a shrug, to which everyone else agreed. From what they could see, Shun was not enslaving the people of the city or starving them. And he was also not trying to deploy his armies to launch an attack on China like he did in the movie since he waited for Tai Lung. So there was really not much to do. I, I don't know. Tigress began. But what I do know is that we can't stay here forever. Pa! She called and turned to the panda, who froze midway through putting the steamed bamboo shoot in his mouth. You are the dragon warrior so you should decide what we are going to do. She said and every eye suddenly turned to him. Even the rabbit who was massaging Viper. Pa slowly put the bamboo shoot in his mouth and swallowed loudly. I mean we can stay here for a few more days and wait for Master Tai Lung to come. If we leave so soon we'd be throwing away his efforts of saving us, right? That would be rude, he said and got the nod of agreement from the others. What? We can't just sit here like ducks and wait for him. Besides, how do you know for certain that he is going to come to our rescue? Tigress asked. Oh, the old goat lady told me. She said Shun has been waiting for Tai Lung. So he had not made any moves yet and I trust her. Pa said, she can do these voodoo, looking into the future Thinji. But still, we can't just do nothing, she said, feeling a little ashamed already at the thought of Tai Lung coming to save them without them doing anything. Would he be disappointed in her? Or, maybe we can, Monkey said, I am pretty sure Shin will not do anything stupid as long as Big Brother Tai Lung exists. Viper laughed, yeah. Did you see the way he froze when he learned Tigress was his sister? She hissed. The others laughed, remembering the almost panicked look on Shin's face, and the way he ordered his soldiers to release her from her chains immediately. Man, I wish I was his brother too, Mantis said, or maybe I can be his son. You know, I never really knew my father. It was because my mom ate his head before I was born. Next time we get interrogated, how about I tell Shin that I am Tai Lung's secret son? You guys will support me. Then maybe I will be allowed to get out of this inn and search for my own fair lady. Mantis said. Gongmen City was known for its ladies and resort. He thought that if he were to find a wife of his own, there was a high chance of that happening in the city. But alas, he was a prisoner. Although it was luxurious and had you could get any material thing you could dream of, you couldn't get love in a room. Mantis, I don't think anyone is going to believe that, Viper said. Why not? It's Tai Lung we are talking about here. Plus, he has inner peace meaning he can do impossible things. His seeds being able to impregnate another species doesn't seem so far-fetched. I think you are forgetting the most important part. Crane said and his eyes looked up at Mantis. How is he supposed to get in there? Oh, Mantis muttered in realization. You're right. I didn't think about that. But not a second later. A creepy smile crossed his face. And so did Crane's. There must have been something that gave them an idea amongst the romance books they have read. Well, he can always argue dash guys. Viper hissed. Could you not? Per is here. Oops, almost said it out loud. Sorry, Pa. I forgot that you didn't know about that, yet. Mantis said, and Pa looked around in confusion. What do you mean? Pa said with a fake laugh, as if amused. 
I can totally understand what you guys are saying. He could not. Panda was innocent and it hasn't even been long since he learned he was not Mr. Pung's real son. We are getting off track here. Tigress yelled and brought them back to the earlier topic. Crane, any idea on a possible plan? She asked the main brain of their team. Crane released a sigh and closed his book before taking a few seconds to think. We are at the ground floor and the bathroom is directly connected to the drainage system under the city. If we break the floor of the bathroom, we should be able to access that pathway to escape, he said and Tigress's eyes lit up. But are we sure that we should do this? What if they capture us again and they don't show us goodwill next time? Crane followed up with another question of hesitance. Crane had always been a warrior with a heart of gold who was righteous in spirit and heroic in his character. So his show of hesitance meant that he didn't think there was something wrong they needed to stop. It was true that most of the citizens were in panic and were fearful. But that was only natural after the sudden change of rulers. And Shen had not shown any actions of needless violence or malice. In his mind, he didn't think there was any need to stir up trouble. Why cause conflict for the sake of it? They were in the city after all and if a fight did break out, the people would suffer in the end. But he also respects Tigress and if she felt the need to act, there must be something wrong since she had always had a good gut feeling. Crane realizes that sometimes, the most logical thing can be wrong as it is directly based only on present information. Tigress stayed silent for a while, wondering if she should follow her friend's judgment. But how long exactly were they going to stay here? No matter how nice it was, they were still prisoners. They have had no contact with the outside world. What if Shin was hiding something? What exactly is happening in the outside world? They have been here for four days now and they need to get out. They shouldn't be suppressed forever. We have to do this, she said. Everyone, get to the bathroom. We are busting out of this place. Everyone stopped what they were doing and the rabbit quickly got out of the room. They got up from their seats and were about to move but a voice from the window suddenly stopped them. You guys do realize the waters would be dirty, right? Everyone paused and looked towards the window. A snow leopard with a robust stature stood in front of the window. He stood at around 6 feet 8 inches feet tall and he had a muscular upper body filled with muscles that seemed to be carved from jade. A small smile stretched across his lips, displaying his sharp lower canines, and although he had no ill intent towards them, a certain pressure took hold of their heart. It was an aura only possessed by the strongest confidence that came from overwhelming strength. Everyone took a moment to process the situation before they all showed a myriad of reaction. Mostly shock and relief. I am sorry this is the first question I ask, but how long have you been standing there? Mantis, as the quickest amongst them, asked first. A while. How much did you hear? I heard everything. Tai Lung deadpanned. Mantis blinked. It was Crane. He smiled first. Hey, don't blame me. And what do you mean I smiled first? You can't even see my face because you are literally standing on my hat. Ouch. Crane yelped as Mantis stabbed him with his forelimbs. How did you do that? Viper asked curiously as she slithered forward. She meant the way he could sneak up on them. As a snake, she was very astute to vibrations and could easily sense anyone even if they did not make a sound or are invisible. So the fact that Tai Lung could sneak up on her surprised her. I have mastered the ability to stand so incredibly still that I became almost invisible to all the senses. Tai Lung said, and then everyone finally noticed that he was indeed standing still. That would explain why Viper couldn't sense him. He didn't move, so there was no vibration. There was a moment of silence as everyone stared at him, waiting for him to magically disappear in their eyes. That was until Pa broke the silence. Whoa! Is that the stealth technique of Master Chameleon, which he developed during the Shinbei invasion so that he could sneak into the enemy's camp and assassinate their commander? Pa asked excitedly with his pupils dilating in excitement. Tai Lung raised an eyebrow. It was always impressive to see Po's vast knowledge of Kung Fu in person. He was undoubtedly the most knowledgeable in the team when it came to Kung Fu. Yes, that is so awesome, Pa said. You could have killed us all even before we know it if you wanted to. But I thought it was only possible with the help of a chameleon's special skin. Many things become possible when one attains inner peace, Tai Lung said. It was not hard to pull off the technique since inner peace was basically becoming one with the world. It naturally had a stealth aspect to it if one really wanted to be stealthy. Speaking of, congratulations on attaining inner peace, Tai Lung said as he could feel Po's endless chi constantly leaking out from him. Unlike Tai Lung who could enter and exit the state of inner peace, Po was constantly in that state. He was leaking out his chi around him and was constantly affecting his environment. 
There was no control over his chi, Tai Lung noticed. But unlike what others would have thought, it works well for Pu. If Tai Lung were to stay in a state of inner peace constantly, his chi would inevitably run out after weeks or maybe months, even if he did not do anything. But Pu wouldn't have to worry about that because the amount of chi he had was endless. Literally endless as Tai Lung could not feel the depth of it. He could not tell how much chi Pu had. He thought he had a huge amount of chi but compared to Pu, it was like comparing water in a lake to an ocean. Endless versus finite. Tai Lung was forced to reflect upon the privilege of being the universe's chosen one. Maybe Kai exploding due to so much chi after Pu gave his chi to him was not just a bullshit for writers to make Pu win. That part was always sad to Tai Lung, even in his past life. General Kai who had constantly been training his chi for 500 years, that too in the spirit realm where you could learn a lot of things about chi than the outside world. Kai developed different chi techniques and even invented a way to steal others' chi yet he was defeated by a newly awakened chi user. And that too by just the quantity of Po's chi alone. He was a spirit warrior said to be immortal but he was defeated just like that. Oh, you noticed, Pa said while rubbing the back of his head with a proud smile. It felt great to be complimented by someone you admired. Yes, it's quite obvious with all of the chi leaking out of you, Tai Lung hummed, wondering if that would have an effect on people. I will have to teach you how to control it properly, Tai Lung said with a smile. Some selfish people might think that it was not wise to teach Pu and make him stronger. Pu already had so much chi so what would happen if he was taught how to use it properly? Wouldn't his title as the strongest be challenged? But that thought never even crossed Tai Lung's mind. His mentality was that of the strong. If he was the strongest only because he put other people down, then he didn't deserve such title. He is the strongest because he is Tai Lung. If others got strong, he would just get even stronger to surpass them. Besides, he was a Kung Fu enthusiast and would never miss an opportunity to witness the growth of the greatest Kung Fu master that will ever live. Yes, he believes that the future Pu can surpass even Ugwe. He was the chosen one, after all, the protagonist of the universe. Plus, Tai Lung would never deny a challenge. Tai Lung. Tigress finally spoke up before stepping towards him. He cracked a genuine smile while she remained serious. What is happening outside? She asked. What are going to do next? It was two related questions. What is happening outside? Was there chaos amongst the citizens? And had Lord Shin made a move? And whatever the answer was, what are they going to do about it? Were they going to escape? With Tai Lung here, they could just break out from the inn. There wouldn't be a need to be discreet. Or are they going to bring down Lord Shin? You guys are free now, Tai Lung said. And about what your next course of action? You will do nothing and return back to the Jade Palace, he said, and everyone nodded at his words. They put his words on the same level of importance as Master Shurfu's. And the situation? Tai Lung drawled and looked at each and every one of them. Shun and I have formed an alliance. Tai Lung's POV. Shun and I have formed an alliance. I broke the shocking news to them and watched as their jaws fell in shock. It was truly a piece of random and impactful news, one that even I was still processing. I never expected Shin to ask for an alliance. In fact, I expected him to hate me to the core for being an obstacle to his grand plan. But I guess you can't get in the mind of a psychotic genius. What? Tigris asked the justified question. Shin and I have formed an alliance, I repeated. You mean you decided to be the guardian of Gong Men City? No, I said, making myself clear. I have formed an alliance with Shun himself and I will be helping him in his quest to conquer China. Everyone gasped at that revelation. At first, they were shocked but now the hard truth was shoved down their throat and they choked on it. Oh, but why? Tigris asked me again. I could see the swirling of different emotions in her eyes. Anger, confusion, hesitance, hope and even a flicker of understanding. Why did I ally with Shun? It was a great question but one I would not indulge in answering. No matter what I said, no one would understand me or my vision. They lacked the knowledge to do so. They did not know of the future where Kai would return and I needed to get stronger. They did not know about my ambition and dream, nor did they realize the extent to which everyone else hated me. Why not? I asked back with a raised eyebrow. Why not? Tigris repeated and stepped forward. Shun is evil. He was the one who destroyed Poe's village and killed his parents. There was a beat of silence as everyone looked at me searching for my reaction to that news. They thought I would be surprised to learn such information about Poe's past. I know. I said instead of showing any other reaction, I was still not imprisoned when that happened. Everyone was stunned to silence. 
They all looked at me with varying eyes but interestingly enough, I seemed the most unbothered by the whole thing. The kid had such a precious heart. You'd expect him to be the most upset amongst everyone and even if he felt betrayed, it would be reasonable. But he just wanted everyone else to get along. He was just chill. I could understand why the universe chose him to wield unimaginable strength. He never wanted to hurt anybody. His heart belied no daggers or malice. So then why? If you know that, why would you still want to work with him? She asked me. The thought that Shin was not a good person had cemented in their mind, even if he acted differently from the movie. Being good or being bad has nothing to do with why I work with him. I said with a shake of my head. I form an alliance with him because Shun, with his genius and weapons, is powerful in his own way. He is powerful in a way I am not, I said. He is useful and we share the same ambition, I said and Tigress thought hard for a while before she nodded in understanding. I smiled and reached out to pat her head. You don't have to worry about it. Shun wouldn't do anything wrong as long as I am around. I will control him by force if I must, I said. I looked around the room and eyed each of my students one by one. There was not even a speck of wound on their body so I was pleased. But then my eyes fell on the food on one table, and my nose instantly smelled the intoxicating aroma. I was hungry since I came rushing to Gongmen City the moment I heard about what happened without stopping for food. Okay, let's eat first while we will all catch up, I said and headed towards the table. The Furious Five and Pa followed behind me and we sat around the table. There was enough dish on the table for us all and Pa ordered more food too. We sat and ate the multiple dishes. My students had smiles on their faces as they were finally relieved of any stress they had prior to my arrival. How could they not be elder brother Tai Lung was here and there was nothing they had to worry about while I was with them. I asked them about how they were while I was away, how their training had progressed, and how they came into conflict with Lord Shin. Crane was the one who answered most of my questions, even though Tigress should be the one. But alas, she was too preoccupied with devouring her fish that she couldn't even answer properly. I knew she would love fish since she was a fellow feline. Apparently, she was hesitant to eat any of the food Shin had given them. So she was just as hungry as me, if not more. We shared a wonderful meal and after we were done, I told them they were free to roam around the city and everyone except Pur and Tigris left the inn after four days. I spent the rest of the day with Tigris while simultaneously training Pur in using his chi and explained to him how inner peace worked. I was not like Ugwe who wanted to keep all the secrets to himself. I would gladly share my knowledge and who knows, Po would make a quicker breakthrough into mastering chi than me and I could learn from him then. And of course, Tigris wanted to spend some time with me. She even asked me to teach her some techniques she could use in case a huge number of people attack her. She realized during the conflict with Shin how she lacked the ability to take on multiple weak opponents, even though she could fight powerful opponents. We also spent some time talking about Shin's weapons. Her official mission required her to get information so I have her some. I told her how the cannons work and a way to counter it. That is, to move around quickly so that they could not aim at you and to wet the fuse with water. The day soon came to an end and my students all went to sleep as I allowed no one to stand guard. I told them I would be guarding them the whole night. Tai Lung's POV we stood at the main platform just outside the Tower of Sacred Flames. There were many soldiers below us, ranging from wolves, gorillas and a few other animal species. The 13 noble houses of Gongmen City were also there to witness the ceremony as they stood at the forefront of the audience. There were probably more than a thousand soldiers but the place was in absolute silence. It was silent to the point that their heartbeat was the loudest sound my ears picked up. The city was also in a complete lockdown. The citizens locked themselves up in their houses, while traders and travelers were chased out. This was an important military event, so certain exercises were executed. There were no such things as a microphone in this world, so there needed to be complete silence since the ruler was about to make an important announcement. Every eye were on me. Yet I did not flinch or show the slightest hint of nervousness under the gaze of more than a thousand. The most prominent emotions I felt from the eyes were that of fear and anger. I could almost taste the fear in the air, and I smiled at that. Imagine a thousand warriors shivering at the sight of one. I no longer hated those eyes. I no longer wished they looked at me with admiration and love. I uprooted the very idea of being seen as a hero from the deepest part of my heart. This is me. I embraced their fear. I smiled at their petty anger, the anger of the weak. I learned to enjoy the way everyone held their breath when I looked at them. I enjoyed the way their hands instinctively went to their weapon due to my mere presence. Shun stood beside me and addressed the crowd, officially announcing our alliance to the world. 
Suffice it to say that everyone was shocked. But I could see some smart nobles and the commanders of the army smile with every word Shin uttered. Shin gave a speech about the future, how he and I would conquer China and unite the Ten Kingdoms once and for all. But in this great conquest of ours, Shin said we needed them. He promised to bring glory and asked his subjects to give him all of their support to fulfill this ambition. He was a great speaker, with charisma unmatched by anything I have ever seen before. I was impressed by his speech and the way he spun words into a spell that cultivated loyalty in his subjects. It reminded me of the politicians in my past life. For so long, our land has been scarred by countless wars. The peace we have is but temporary. A thin veil that hides the true darkness, he said with powerful words. His sentences were not hurried and left a mark on everyone's heart. It was not only because of Shun's charisma either, but also because it was mixed with the truth. The land of China had never seen true peace in all of its years. It was not like my past life where China had different dynasties and was ruled by one big empire which changed only after centuries. This world was much more complicated than that. Wars were not won only by soldiers but by masters of Kung Fu. And with each of them being able to change the tide of wars by themselves, there can never be a permanent wielder of a major power. Even if one kingdom seems stronger than the other, one amazing warrior would pop out and change the power dynamic in mere decades. That was why China was never under one domination and the kingdoms were in a constant war for territory. There were ten kingdoms in China and under the codes of war introduced by Uguay, they waged wars against each other. A great war was when more than half of the kingdom participated in war and disregarded the codes of war. But there have been no such cases in a long time. But that doesn't mean wars have stopped, though. At least two to three kingdoms were always in conflict. A great example was the war for control in the West, during which the Monkey King came into power and put a stop before things settled into a conclusion. As I said, one master can change the war in an instant. The rulers of the Ten Kingdoms will never be satisfied. They will continue to wage wars and slaughter each other, due to their own greed. Shin yelled out. The thin veil of peace had also been destroyed after Ugwe's death. When he was alive, we could look at him in times of need, but he is no more. The kingdoms had also noticed this, and they are preparing themselves for a great war again. With the one who maintains peace in this land gone, China needs a new moderator. This world is cursed, and the incoming disaster is so great that it calls for me, a banished prince. And I will do whatever I can to fulfill my duty, my destiny. Together, Tai Lung and I shall accomplish what no one has been able to do in the history of China. In the history of this world, with my weapons and with Tai Lung's unparalleled strength, we will go through China like the most violent storm after a perpetual drought. We will wage a massive war against the Ten Kingdoms but with unstoppable force. We will force China to its knees. Shun said and paused to let his words sink into the crowd. And what a great war it will be, he whispered. Yet his voice could be heard from anywhere. It will be unlike anything this land had ever seen surpassing the previous great wars by a huge margin. But this time it will not be for naught. After all, a storm even though it is violent, destructive and is thought to be evil, it will bring back life to our land once more. The cursed soil ruined by drought will finally get the rainstorm it requires. China shall get the correction it needed. He looked ahead at the horizon as if peering into the future, and he slowly stepped forward to get closer to the crowd of soldiers and nobles who were entranced by his presence. It will be a war that will end all wars. The silence was suddenly broken like glass. The deafening cheers and screams crashed into the world. It was so loud that it shook the whole city and rumbled like thunder through the space. The look in the eyes of the soldiers and nobles was that of fanatics, ready to throw away their lives for the great purpose that Shun had presented them. Of course, what Shun said was all but fabricated words. They did not know that. Shun walked back at me with a pleased smile on his face which got tainted with evil when he turned his back on the crowd. He took a small dagger from his robe, a curly dagger decorated with gold, diamond and jade. Shun cut his own wings and let his blood spill on the sacred ground while he said his oath. He promised to become my ally and a brother in arms as we went on our conquest. I did the same after and cut my own hands and let my blood spill on the sacred grounds. In my name, in my blood and in the name of Kung Fu, I promised to fight for our ambition until the very end. It was finally official. Lord Shin presented me with spiky shoulder pad armor to signify my position as the Supreme General of the Army. With that, I held even more authority over the army than he did. I walked forward as the thundering crowd looked at me with fear and respect in their eyes. After Shin's great speech, 
my reputation had also been greatly boosted as someone who shared the same dream. Behold, the warrior who will lead you to victory. Supreme General Tai Lung. Shun declared and I raised my hand to the exploding soldiers. They cheered for a long time until all the soldiers kneeled before me. Then the wolves started howling. The gorillas beat their chest and every animal made a sound of respect. Like it had been said before, it was an alliance even though it would make more sense if I worked under Shin. But I did not, so that meant that although Shin had the whole city and such a great army under his rule, I could rival it with my strength alone. That was a feat worthy of the utmost respect. I looked at the cheering crowd and the kneeling soldiers. Felt so perfect. Felt so right. I could get used to this. Third POV after the ceremony was done, Tai Lung and Shin returned to the tower. They were followed by the family head of each house and the commanders of the army. Then, they proceeded to start planning for the upcoming war they were about to wage. Shun with his intelligence and Tai Lung with his knowledge of the art of war were the main brainpower behind the strategy they came up with. There was no need to delay the attack any further as that would just give the kingdoms more time to prepare themselves. So they decided to attack as soon as the following week. The speech that Lord Shin gave in the ceremony was also recorded in a letter, which was then spread amongst the citizens and to the rest of China. It was a declaration of war. China entered a state of awkward times as every kingdom prepared for the war, yet the kings waited for Shun to make the first move. Although Shun had declared war against all of them, the kingdoms did not work together to defeat him. Instead, they waited for the right opportunity and were always ready to take advantage of Lord Shun's attack. There were ten kingdoms that currently ruled over pretty much the whole landscape of China, other than the rare independent places like Gongmen City and the Jade Palace. There was the Kingdom of Dali and the Kingdom of Minyue in the south. They can be said to be the only two neighboring kingdoms that had a good relationship, as they prospered in trade and maintained the Silk Route, which facilitated trade between China and Southeast Asia. The Kingdom of Nanjiao and Shu were always at each other's throats in the west with the recent war. Each of them had two powerhouses, Mighty Eagle and the Monkey King, which put them in a stalemate with each other. The Kingdom of Wu and Wu Yue shared territory in the east and were once one giant kingdom. But it was split apart in a civil war, with the criminals living in the Kingdom of Wu and the rest staying in Wu Yue. The Kingdom of Chu and Tang were located in central China and never really at war with each other, since the Jade Palace occupied the border between them. Whenever a conflict was about to start, the Jade Palace would put a stop to it before it could get serious. Tai Lung himself had been given a mission to settle disputes between the two kingdoms countless times. These two territories had a big influence since they were in the center of China and there was a time in the past when the dispute between them got so bad that a great war almost broke out, in which more than half of the kingdoms would participate in one war. It was Tai Lung who put an end to this budding great war and it was also the last mission Shurfu gave Tai Lung as a test to see if he truly deserves the title of the Dragon Warrior. After which Shurfu brought Tai Lung to Ugwe where the cannon unfolded. It was due to this feat that the other kingdoms were more than happy to imprison Tai Lung and even built the Croc Gom prison to hold him. He held too much power and ruined many of their plans so they took their revenge on him. How else would the Jade Palace have enough resources to carve a prison right out of a mountain and station an elite 1000 rhino soldiers for two decades? It was due to the funding of the kingdoms. And lastly, the kingdoms of Jingnan and Zhou were in the north. These two were extremely hostile to each other but would never go into a proper war because invaders from Russia, Mongolia and Korea were always ready to take advantage of their weakness to conquer China. It was due to this that the two kingdoms rarely dealt with the other kingdoms, as they were always busy fighting off invaders or with themselves. It was also because of this that they wanted more territory and power. All of these kingdoms were not allies, even though some might be on friendly terms. So none of them wanted to waste any substantial amount of troops just to deal with Shun and weaken their force so that other kingdoms could take advantage of them. Although Shun had his weapons and although they were powerful, his army was the size of a city and couldn't compare to the military might of a whole kingdom. If he were to disregard the codes of war and launch a surprise attack on the main city of a kingdom like Shun in the movie was trying to do, then he might be successful in taking over one kingdom. Then he could take over the resources to build more weapons to conquer the other kingdoms. But with Tai Lung by his side, things have changed. With Tai Lung's neutral moral nature and his sense of honor as a warrior, Shun couldn't break the codes of war. But on the other hand, he now had enough power to rival the military might of a kingdom. Or maybe even more, Shun thought to himself when he realized the true value of having Tai Lung as a general. He was not only just a master of kung fu but of war who learned many strategies and siege tactics from the library of the Jade Palace. But there was one other reason why Lord Shun changed his evaluation of Tai Lung, it was because of his innovative ideas. 
Of course, it was not hard for Tai Lung to give ideas, as he had knowledge of another world. Especially when it came to the usage of gunpowder, let's just say Tai Lung had to keep himself from saying too much. Shun with his genius mind could comprehend the true weight of Tai Lung's suggestion and immediately got his mind to work and just like that, they brew up a plan to conquer the whole of China. The two of them worked together perfectly, as if they were always meant to be allies. They covered each other's weaknesses and truly became a force to be reckoned with. Third POV. A few days later. Come on now pups, try harder. Tai Lung screamed at the wolf soldiers as they trained according to Tai Lung's instructions. There were more than a thousand wolf soldiers alone as they lined up and executed different techniques with their weapons. They were currently in the middle of preparation for war and even though it might seem foolish to train the soldiers now when the war was about to start in a few days, that did not apply when the teacher was Tai Lung. Although it will only be for a couple of days, the training they received here would be priceless and it would save the lives of many people while also allowing them to eliminate more enemies. You are preparing for war. Forget about all the combat teachings you've had until now. Your aim is no longer to defeat the enemy, but to eliminate them with the least amount of effort. Tai Lung said before he clapped his hand suddenly. A shockwave erupted as the camp exploded in a terrible sound. It was a wing technique that allowed someone to create a loud, echoing sound of shockwave. The wolves nearby whimpered and fell to their knees. They covered their ears as their ears rang in pain. Learn to control your own senses. When the real battle starts, the cannons are going to explode with louder sounds. You can't get affected by it. Tai Lung said, scolding them. Wolves have a very acute sense of hearing like snow leopards and they needed to learn how to be immune to loud explosions if they wanted to fight in a war. The training ground which was outside of the city was bustling as they all learned under Tai Lung. He would approach the wolves one by one and decimate them while giving them advice. Stop swinging your sword like that. Not only are you predictable but you can harm your own ally in a war. Tai Lung told the boss wolf, it's better if you can stab. Boss Wolf was more adept with using a war hammer but that was not a good weapon for war as it wastes a lot of energy and as one of the commanders, he needed to be fighting without stopping. Are those teeth only for display? Tai Lung asked and right after, the Boss Wolf lunged forward to bite him. Tai Lung dodged and grabbed his maw. Good. And the teaching continues. Tai Lung could not train the guerrilla soldiers as they were busy preparing the battleship and the cannons. But he made do with what he could and taught the wolves as best as he could. He dug into his memories and used his vast knowledge of Kung Fu to help them as much as he could with the limited time. As the Supreme General, he couldn't have incompetent soldiers. He also trained them in making different formations and taught them how to train even in his absence. Pain is inevitable. Suffering is not. Tai Lung said as hundreds of soldiers groaned in pain while they did body training. Tai Lung trained them to exhaustion just to see how fit and strong his soldiers were and although it could have been better, the wolves were to an acceptable standard. Learn to enjoy the training and know that the more you sweat here, the less you will bleed in battle. Tai Lung said to the wolves who looked at him with respect. So even when you feel pain, do not allow your mind to suffer. Embrace the pain, for it is proof of your improvement. Tai Lung said and the soldiers nodded at their general. Now do it again. Tai Lung's POV. So you finally came back, Shurfu said with his eyes closed and his back facing me. He was sitting in a meditative position on top of a single rock, while the surroundings were covered with a shallow puddle of water. There was a dragon-shaped statue on the roof of the cave, which was covered in a thin layer of green algae. The constant crashing of waterfalls brought a sense of comfort and the sound was oddly pleasing to the ears. This was the Dragon Grotto, a large cavern located at the top of a waterfall beside the Jade Palace. Ugwe often used it as a place to meditate and now it was used by Shurfu. Yes, but not for long. I said, the day after tomorrow we were going to set out for our battle, and I thought I should meet my father one last time before heading to battle. Although I was confident in my abilities, anything could happen in a war. How did the journey treat you, my son? Shurfu asked me as he stayed in his place. I cracked a smile at his question. It was far from the journey I expected. It was short and eventful, but it was also eye-opening. Is it now? Shurfu said. I could feel the smile in his voice. I heard you were quite rough with your old acquaintances. Can't say I didn't warn them. Shurfu chuckled for a short while before he stood up and turned to me. His eyes looked at me with the love of a father, and his serene smile put me at ease. I am sure you did, he said and walked towards me. He used Hing Kung and his chi to walk on top of the water as he came by my side. So, he drawled and gestured with his hands to follow me. 
I heard you became the Supreme General for Lord Shin and his army. I followed him as we walked towards the edge of the cavern, and we stood there to gaze at the beauty of the green valley below. I did. I said and shook my head. Although I did not see it coming either. Shin really has a way with words to convince me. Shurfu laughs, yes. I do remember little Shin to be quite the orator while also being charismatic. His father was always so proud, and we would have a friendly competition on who has the more accomplished son. I smiled at that and recalled the past. The past, when things were so much simpler and easier. So, a war that will be the end of all wars, huh? Shurfu asked me. Tell me, son, how much of that is true? I stayed silent for a few seconds before I opened my mouth to answer. All of it is true and more. Although it was only a part of my plan, my desire to unite China and get it under one rule was very real. The greater good might not be my first priority, but it was definitely one of the reasons why I am doing this. More? Shurfu raised an eyebrow. Yes. Like I said before, I have had an eye-opening experience. I said and paused. I think I know where I will be going from now on. I have found my own path. Shurfu turned towards me and the most heartfelt smile appeared on his face. I am proud of you, son. I wish you luck in whatever you are trying to achieve. After all, it is a dream that came from your own heart and not inspired by the selfish wish of some red panda. I was thrown in for a loop as I got lost in his smile. I felt a tightness in my heart and there was no longer a doubt or hesitation in my heart. I was afraid of how Shurfu would react towards what I was planning and my goal to unify China but in the end, I was only met with a father who was happy to see his son chase after his ambition. And I am glad that you are putting an end to this whole thing and give a much needed conclusion for China. I know you have the power and in my opinion, it is a good thing, Shurfu said. If it must happen, I am happy knowing you will do it. My lips thinned as I took in his words. I'm afraid the reason behind it comes not from a righteous heart nor good intention. Although you can deduce that by now with how I am working with Shin. Shurfu chuckled, does it matter? Sometimes we do the right things for the wrong reasons and the wrong things for the right reasons. And there is nothing wrong with Shin. You know, he was the only one that was banished from Gongmen City and the wolves and the gorillas follow him by their own free will. Even though they knew Shin would not be able to reward them nor bring them glory, they decided to follow and serve him with their life. That should at least tell you that he is more than just a cruel ruler, Shurfu said. I suppose that is one way you look at it. As long as you follow the codes of war, you will have my blessing in your conquest, Shurfu said and waited for my reply. The codes of war will be respected, I said with a nod. The codes of war were something made by Ugwe a long time ago and date back as far as a thousand years. It was a list of codes Ugwe had carefully created after he learned that conflict and wars were a part of nature. Death was what gave meaning to life. The codes of war were signed by the five dynasties, which were the direct forebearers of the ten kingdoms. The codes of war were exactly like the name suggests, something which should be respected in war times. This was not new as even in my past life, something similar had always existed in history. Some of the codes include showing mercy when either side surrenders to the victor, planting trees on the battleground one year after it took place, sparing the soldiers that surrender, and not doing things like not involving civilians in the war, not poisoning or messing with food sources of other kingdoms, not forcing your own citizens into war-related matters, the prohibition of more than half of the kingdom to participate in one war, etc. It was basically a list of codes that should be respected during wars. They were what brought a sense of order into a chaotic event such as war. And all the kingdoms respected it most of the time as they did not want those things to happen to them even if it meant not being able to do it to others. You know, speaking about the codes of war, I remember there was a time Ugwe used to be a war general as well. He had seen firsthand how bloody a war without order could get, and it was what motivated him to create it in the first place. I hummed an acknowledgement and Shurfu and I shared each other company for a few hours, sometimes we talked about the students, we talked about the past, and most of the time we just enjoyed the peace and the silence. But as the sun got closer to sinking into the horizon, I knew my time with my father was up. I will be going now, I said. Of course, we can't let the Supreme General be absent for long, Shurfu said. I walked away from the place and right as I was about to use flash steps to fly, I heard Shurfu's voice. Stay safe, son. And if you ever need any help, know that I will always be here, Shurfu said, and I turned back to look at him with wide eyes. How could I not? The Jade Palace had been a neutral party for as long as it had existed. But what he just said defied the very foundation of the Jade Palace. He was basically telling me that if I ever needed help, no matter who was after me, he will be there to shelter and help me. He was the master of the Jade Palace. 
He had a heavy responsibility and duty on his shoulders, but a father's love triumphs over that. I let out a genuine hearty laugh and cracked a smile. Love has made you soft, father. Then I shot towards the sky and by propelling myself every time I was about to fall, I flew towards Gongmen City and covered the distance which would have taken five days to cover in five hours. Third POV. The kingdom of Shu in the west. Shun has finally made a move. An old baboon said and silence followed the throne room. There were many people gathered in the throne room ranging from soldiers, commanders, generals and the king of Shu. There was also a certain monkey king in the room and he covered his face after hearing the news. And the king of Shu asked, he was a giant orangutan that was known for his cunning and wisdom. He had a huge belly and would constantly reach out his long arms for food. They are heading west. Or to be more precise, they are heading towards us. The old baboon said and everyone stilled. As if a soundless lighting had just struck the throne room. Lord Shin and his army had begun making their move and the first kingdom they went after was the closest to them. The kingdom of Shu located in the western part of China. How big is the army? A deep and rough voice rang out in the silence. It was the general of the Shu kingdom. He was mean-looking mandrill with a nasty, colorful face that struck an odd sense of horror to everyone who saw him. Around a thousand strong, the old baboon said and opened the scroll in his hand once more. It was the information provided by Master Gazelle of the Kung Fu Council. The Kung Fu Council wanted vengeance against Lord Shin and was willing to work with any kingdom that was to face off against Shin. In their mind, Shun was a coward who murdered their leader using a trick and an evil dictator who must be put down. So when Shun made a move against Chu, they immediately reached out to the kingdom and offered their assistance. The quote, the enemy of the enemy is my friend, perfectly captures their standing. According to the information provided by Master Gazelle of the Kung Fu Council herself, the army consists of around 200 guerrilla soldiers, 500 wolves, and around 300 other soldiers of Gongmen City. He said and paused to read the scroll more carefully. It seems the soldiers of Gongmen are put at the front lines to be used as pawns, while nearly half of Shun's army are still stationed in the city to control the citizens. Master Ox and Master Croc are also stationed in the front lines and the army is directly led by Shun and Tai Lung. Silence descended the throne room but you could hear a groan from the Monkey King. Are you sure they are coming for us and not the other kingdoms? The king asked in a hopeful tone. Yes, they made it clear that they meant to attack us in their speech, and the direction they are moving directly points towards us. How long till they reach the kingdom? One noble asked. At the time of writing this scroll, the army is still on the boat crossing the Pearl Lake. But the weapons Shin created are heavy, so they should take some time to reach here. It will take them around three days to reach our borders. We got more than enough time to prepare then. General, what do you think should be our next course of action? The king asked. The mandrill took a few seconds to gather his thoughts. We send scouts and spy to check on the situation and how the army is separated. They are not that many so they may not even separate. We need to put our forces on the north. That is the place they will most likely attack from, the general said. There were not many towers or walls built in the north so it was the most suitable place for an attack, especially if they were only a 1,000 force strong. The east, west and south were all places where they shared a border with the neighboring kingdom, the Nanjiao kingdom. There were plenty of towers, barracks, camps, walls etc. built there and the soldiers who were always stationed there were well trained and plentiful. Meanwhile, the north was peaceful and the soldiers they put there were mostly to fend off bandits and protect trading routes and nothing else. There were no other kingdoms located there as it was foreign ground and that made it more vulnerable. So if someone with a small army were to launch an attack, it would most likely be from the north. They would make their way through the cities and capture their capital that way. Okay. Then we need to send reinforcement to the north. We will show that peacock just who he is messing with. Lord Shun's ambition dies here because he chose the wrong kingdom to attack first. The orangutan king said, For now, they will send their army to the north and wait for more information about the enemy. Fortunately, the enemy was respecting the code of wars and it makes things easier. They outnumber Shun's army by one to a hundred. Even if Tai Lung was to lead them, it wouldn't make up for the differences in sheer numbers. Amongst them, only the monkey king who was the guardian of the capital city was doubtful. While the leaders of Shu were busy making plans and coming up with a strategy to deal with the real threat, which was the alliance of Shun and Tai Lung, a foreboding storm was brewing all across China. The other kingdoms were spying on the events carefully and became silent observers for the moment. They were waiting for the right time to move where they would be able to reap the most benefits. 
They did not send reinforcement to the Kingdom of Shu nor made trouble in the borders to take advantage of their preparation. Instead, they gave Lord Shun and the Kingdom of Shu the space they needed to battle against each other. The hearts of the people all across China were also struck by fear and anticipation. Although wars were common and hearing the news of different kingdoms waging wars was not that rare. What was happening before them was something new. Something more, cursed. Tai Lung, the name, struck chords of fear in their heart as his strength and threat rang out like a melody throughout China. Although he was hated, feared and everything in between, people were not strangers to the power this snow leopard holds. Yet he was now armed with even more power. The Supreme General Tai Lung naturally held more weight than the villain-slash-criminal Tai Lung. Trade still flourished even in Gongmen City and the people were still living their normal lives as the codes of war were respected but everyone knew that a great change was happening around them in real time. China was silent and still as it witnessed history, the start of a legendary saga. On the west coast of China, a certain snow leopard leapt off the boat and landed on the sand. His senses took in the world around him in meticulous detail that would overload the mind of the average animal. A thick fog covered the surroundings, but as if having the ability to see through the clouds, a smile crept up to his face as he looked towards the kingdom of Shu. And so it begins, he said. He was wearing a gauntlet and a shoulder guard made from iron to show his status as the general, but he left the rest of his torso bare to the world, as if saying he did not need the protection of any armor. A seemingly reckless attire for a general who was about to fight a war. But if you knew the extent of his power, you would understand why he did not need such heavy and restricting armor. And then behind him, many boats arrived at the beach and the guerrilla soldiers leaped out of the boat to anchor them and to unload the cannons contained. Get ready. Anchor the boats and unload the weapons. Don't keep the general waiting. Boss Wolf quickly yelled out his orders before he howled into the sky. All of the wolves in the pack quickly joined the howl, and the fog slowly disappeared to reveal hundreds of soldiers landing on the beach, preparing for war. Third POV. The Spirit Realm, HMMMMMMMMMMMM. Ugwe hummed as he floated near a peach tree. His body was positioned in a meditative position and his eyes were closed in concentration. After a long time of meditation, the old tortoise who never found peace and rest even after death opened his eyes. This is truly bad. He said with a sagely nod but a carefree chuckle followed. Even though he was just a spirit in the spirit realm, he could still see the events happening in the mortal realm and he still had his foresight. Even if no one was aware of it, he was guiding the world from the spirit realms. He did this mostly by sending messages to the people in the mortal realm. Ugwe let out a sigh and shook his head. For a master who preached the teaching of inner peace and was considered the wisest of all, he sure did have many regrets after his death most of which he only came to realize now after his death. There were many things he wished he had done differently, but that's okay. Ugwe smiled. For so long he considered himself to be wise and thought he had learned everything there was to learn. But the universe had a strange way of enlightening someone. He was not perfect, he was not without flaws. But that gave Ugwe a chance to have faith again. Ugwe tilted his head slightly as a green blade whizzed past him. He finally opened his eyes and saw his old friend Kai who had returned once more to battle him. Ah Kai, I was tired of waiting for you, Ugwe said and a wrinkly smile appeared on his aged face. Oh, did you miss me already while I was away? Kai chuckled and pulled back his chained blade with a flick of his wrist. I found something interesting while I was away, Kai said and showed off a jade amulet which was shaped like a rhino. He was an interesting kid, had a powerful chi too. Kai said with a smile and flexed his muscles which bulged out with raw strength once held by Master Rhino. Ah, Master Thundering Rhino, Ugwe said, recognizing the chi before he shook his head with pity. Such a tragedy to see him here so young. The young child had much to learn. Yeah, yeah, anyways, Kai drawled as he scratched his chin with his blade. Have you ever heard of a warrior named Tai Lung? Ugwe froze for a brief instance. I may or may not have heard of him, yes. He said with a wry smile, I fought with the rhino kid to steal his children and before I finally turned him into a jade pendant. I told him to be glad that he was going to be extinguished by my hands, the strongest warrior he has ever fought. And, and, the kid said I was not the strongest warrior he had fought. He said that title belongs to someone named Tai Lung. A peal of laughter rolled off Ugwe's throat. I can see that, yes. Are you mocking me? How can I mock you, my old friend? You are like a brother to me. Ugwe said while wiping a tear off his eye. Kai huffed and released steam from his nose. Then he started spinning his weapon, 
getting ready to fight again. Get ready for round, whatever it is, Kai said and an excited smile soon split his face. Ugwe smiled for one last time before his eyes started glowing golden and the hero Chi surrounded him. Kai was taken aback, as it was the first time he had seen Ugwe get serious in their confrontation. I'm sorry Kai, but I will have to hold you back here for a little bit longer. He said, the world is still not ready for your revival. Bastard! Kai yelled and exploded out to clash with his old friend. A great explosion erupted in the spirit reel, disintegrating everything in the vicinity as two powerhouses met in an epic clash. This was the one way Ugwe could repent for his mistake. Kai was not as strong as Kanan since he did not get Tai Lung's chi, so he would be able to hold him off for a little longer. But all he can do was buy more time for the world. Kai's return was inevitable. Third POV after the army of Gongmen City crossed Pearl Lake, they immediately headed further down west. Their movements were greatly slowed down by the heavy cannons they carried like the enemy had predicted, and they took three whole days to reach the border of Shu. It was at this point that they started executing their war strategy, which was quite simple. They will send their strongest force to the north of the kingdom and launch an attack from there. The rest of the army would then attack from the east which was the furthest from the neighboring kingdom to make sure that no reinforcements could come from the other kingdoms. In this battle, Lord Shen planned to use the element of surprise and march his way straight through the defenses Shu would erect to stop them. Although people knew that he had a weapon that could even kill the likes of Master Rhino, they were not aware of the full extent of its abilities. They probably thought it was a weapon that target one person at a time, and not something that works better against a huge army than a single individual. There were also the new explosives that he had devised with the help of Tai Lung, so he was at least confident in taking any elite army Shu would put forward to stop them. It will be an absolute devastation. The plan is simple. We will send our strongest force to the north, and the rest will move towards the east and attack from there. Lord Shin addressed his soldiers, and amongst them, Master Ox and Master Croc shared a look. When night came and while everyone else was asleep, Master Ox sneaked away from the camp. Master Ox and Master Croc were forced to fight in this war by Tai Lung as he threatened them to not only kill them but the citizens of Gong Men City would suffer if they disobey his orders. With all his bad reputation, the masters did not doubt his words and called his bluff. So for now, as the sworn protector of the Gong Men City and its citizens, they will fight in the war against Chu. They have been invaluable asset to the army as they were not only great instructors for the soldiers, their fighting power was one of the best as you would expect from the higher ranks of the Kung Fu Council. But they were not planning to be helpless victims in this war. They were more than just lost lamps. Tai Lung could force and control to his whims. Here take it, Master Ox said in a hushed voice and gave a scroll to a messenger bird who was hiding in the bushes. The scroll contained the plans and strategy Tai Lung and Lord Shin had devised. Thank you, Master Ox. The messenger said his heartful thanks to the one-horned ox before he flew away in the night. He was an owl, so there was no sound as he flapped his wings and took off into the night. Master Ox watched as the messenger flew away, and he slowly sneaked back into the camp. But through the whole ordeal, he did not notice the pair of yellow eyes which glow eerily in the dark. They were always on him. A few days later, the eastern defense line of Shu, after getting information from Master Gazelle and making sure that the war strategy of Lord Shin and Tai Lung was just as expected, the Shu dispatched most of its soldiers to the north to stop the attack. But the east was not disregarded either as 5,000 soldiers which consisted of mostly primates were stationed in the eastern walls. Three days quickly passed and then four, finally Lord Shin and his army had reached the eastern defensive lines but something was wrong. There was a taste of something else in the air, and as the soldiers of Shu looked at the horizon where the army of Shin was slowly appearing, they knew they had made a huge blunder. All of the army are here. Damn it. We have been tricked. The monkey king who had been ordered to lead the defensive line in the east cursed out loud when he saw the thousand strong soldiers coming towards them. They have been thoroughly tricked. But how could that happen? The information they got was from Master Ox himself and it should definitely be trustworthy because even Lord Shin had repeated the plan many times to his soldiers. So how? Not the time. Monkey King bit on his own tongue as he looked around at the soldiers he was leading. They were 5,000 strong and definitely had the advantage against the enemy when it came to number. But he knew that would not be able to make up for the difference in the quality of their power. The army had Tai Lung and the weapons that Lord Shin had created. Soldiers, prepare for battle. We have to protect our home from the evil claws of Tai Lung and Lord Shun. Monkey King yelled out as his soldiers gathered their courage to face the full force of the Gongmen army. 
They could see them on the horizon and they were marching ever closer. They were only a thousand strong yet the presence they had made them seem ten times that amount. Messenger! Monkey King called out and a small crow flew towards him. Fly back to the capital and report the situation immediately. We have been tricked by Lord Shin. There will be no attack in the north as all of the army had gathered here. Ask for reinforcement as quickly as possible. The Monkey King said the crow immediately took off to report the news to the enemy. The Monkey King clicked his tongue when he saw the slow flight speed of the crow. They sent a lot of birds to scout the enemy army and most of them never returned as they were probably killed by the enemy birds or even Tai Lung himself who knew the crane technique. So the current messenger they had was just a civilian they recruited to make up for all of the lost birds as some who refused to continue working for them in fear of death. Ready the catapult. Archers get into position. Monkey King yelled and his voice infused with chi was able to reach even the ears of the enemy. They have towers and a huge wall that is 20 miles long and protects the King of Shu from the east. They have the advantage of numbers and home ground, so he hoped they could hold the force long enough for reinforcement to come. The soldiers moved into position as quickly as they could and they started loading up the catapult, which they would launch the moment the enemy crossed their range. Monkey King used a telescope and looked at the enemy. He could see them stopping way before they entered into the range of the catapult and archers. Then they started loading up the weapons which were called cannons. He cursed under his breath and quickly counted how many of the weapons there were. While he was doing so, his eyes searched for the person he dreaded the most but oddly enough, he could not find him. That gave him a bad feeling but he did see Lord Shin who was standing at the forefront of the army. The Monkey King focused on Shun, who had the most carefree and easygoing smile he had ever seen on a king in the middle of war. It was the smile of a victor. And then, Lord Wen waved his wings and his beaks moved to speak one order. Monkey King could read what came out of Shun's beak. Fire! Oh! God damn it! Monkey King cursed and put away his telescope to stare at the horizon, which was suddenly lit up in the color of red. Then he saw streaks of red line flying towards the wall and to his soldiers. They were like fireworks but he knew they were something much worse. If fireworks were the manifestation of dreams and wonder, this one was a nightmare, a hell on earth. Boom, 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 boom. The sound reached them and they were a melodious beat of their death, a song to their funeral. It would likely be impossible to hold the fort until reinforcement arrives. It would be a miracle if they held out for half a day. But fortunately, Monkey King could maybe provide that miracle they needed. Brace yourselves! Monkey King yelled as the soldiers ran around like headless chickens. They have been through countless wars and they trained all of their life learning the way of violence. But this was like nothing they had ever seen before. This was an advanced form of war which none of them were familiar with. It was the ultimate violence of the future. They knew how to fight against soldiers and warriors but what they faced was the cold touch of metal and the indifferent heat of a raging fire. The cannons reached them and they crashed against the stone wall of their defense. An explosion followed as the towers and fort shook violently. The Monkey King, the Sage of the West let out his chi and his body was soon covered with the heroic color of gold. He leapt off and bravely faced the cannonballs but the rest of the soldiers were meat in a pot, waiting to be butchered. Limbs flew off and the shockwave sent the soldiers to their death as they met their end without even being able to fight back. The weapons Shin had created were truly cruel as the soldiers did not get the glorious death they always dreamed of. Instead, they met their end like any civilian. Absolutely helpless. War was violent, the Monkey King knew this as someone who gained fame through wars. But what he witnessed that day was beyond anything he had ever seen before. Rush towards the enemy. Monkey King yelled as he punched and kicked away multiple cannonballs but they were just too many in number. It was just a waste of his chi they could not fight back from this range so if they wanted to even stand a chance against them, they needed to close the gap between themselves. The soldiers got out of the towers and leapt off the walls before they started running towards the enemy. My soldiers push forward. Monkey King yelled and ran first with his body covered in golden glory. In return, Lord Shin ordered his men to aim a little lower as they started massacring the incoming enemy. Monkey King watched as they became the attacker when they were supposed to be the defender. He also watched as his men quickly dwindled in number with every meter of distance they covered. It was then that he realized how easily Shin turned the war in his favor. The advantages they had, being the defender in their fort and their number, slowly died as Lord Shin flipped the table. Ha 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 ha! A desperate laugh rolled off the Monkey King as he witnessed how easily Shin took away their advantages and made them his own. They were basically puppet under his control, 
He had every right to smile like a victor before the war even started. Monkey King realized. He watched as his soldiers died due to the explosions of the weapons. But he thought at least he would avenge them by killing Lord Shin when he reached them. He may be helpless when it was long range, but when he reached them. That dream also quickly died down when he remembered Tai Lung was somewhere there and two of his friends, Master Ox and Croc, stood beside Lord Shin to protect him. A sage, a prodigy, a war hero. How can he be so helpless? At least, Shun will only win this battle. He can never win the war. When the soldiers in the north reach the east to give a reinforcement, they will put an end to Lord Shin and Tai Lung's ambition. After all, the fact that they would be sending their strongest force to the east was just a lie to trick them. And the soldiers there will quickly realize it and come back to help in the eastern fronts. The north of Shu, what is the meaning of this? The general of the Shu military asked as he looked through his telescope. On the north of Shu, 50,000 soldiers were stationed here to protect against the invasion of Gongmen. From the information they got, the strongest force was going to invade from the north, so they stationed 10 times the amount they put in the east. Yet even when it was about time the army reached the northern defense line, there was no army in sight. Instead, there was one person walking slowly towards them. He was wearing a black cloak that hid all of his body, so they were not sure who it was. The person in the hood took out his hands from the cloak and started badging his hands. He wrapped the white bandage tightly around each of his fingers in such a way that his claws remained out and not retracted. I thought they were sending their strongest force here, to the north, the general muttered in confusion. They did. Tai Lung's image? Tai Lung's POV. I wrapped my hands with the bandage and made sure my claws remained out without having to flex my fingers constantly. Although it did not hinder me in a fight, it was a different case when it was war. It would be a battle of attrition for me, especially since I was going up against 50,000 soldiers alone. So I could not waste any stamina or focus on my claws and by doing this, they would not retract automatically like it usually does. I continued marching fearlessly towards the enemy army while I finished wrapping my hands. Then I coat my claws with my chi as they started letting out black smoke and they became pitch black. Can this be considered armament hockey? I pondered in my mind as my feet continued pacing towards the enemy. After I was a little closer, I looked up and quickly scanned my enemy. They had spike walls which were roughly made in a hurry and towers which were built with logs and ropes. They probably made that as quickly as they could and even though the quality was barely acceptable, the sheer amount they were able to build in a matter of days was impressive. I looked to the side and tried to see the end of the ever-expanding spiky walls but I couldn't. They probably spanned over miles at least. But the most interesting part about the enemy was the sheer number they had. No one would argue if you said it was impossible for one person to defeat 50,000 soldiers. Even if they remained still and without fighting and I killed one soldier every second, it would take me a whole day to kill them all. That was how outnumbered I was. Yet I did not feel a drop of nervousness in my heart against such vast enemies. If Master Rhino could slay 10,000 serpents when he was young, I assure you I can slay 50,000 elite soldiers of Shu. Obviously, the serpents Master Rhino slayed were an untrained group of bandits in the Valley of Woe while mine were elite soldiers of Kingdom Shu. But to make up for it, I was also much stronger than him. So in theory, I should be able to come out victorious from this battle. Probably. In the end, I like the challenge and it will be a great way to get a reputation other than just being labeled as a villain due to Ugwe's words. Not only that, it will be a huge moral boost to my soldiers for the other wars to come. The soldiers who stood opposite to me were mostly made up of primates ranging from chimpanzee, mandrills, gorillas, baboon etc. But there were also few other types of animals with them. The Kingdom of Shu, also known as Shu Han, is a kingdom located in the west and their territory is characterized by rugged terrain, including mountains, rivers, and dense forests. This geographical position provided natural defenses against invading forces and helped shape Shu's military strategies. So although the soldiers in front of me were made to stop any forces from invading, they were far from being their last line of defense. This was another reason why I came alone here, attacking from the north. The north especially had rough terrains which were not very suitable for an army to travel much less an army with iron cannons. So it would be easier and more convenient if a strong individual force could spear through the northern defense alone. I continued walking towards the army and when I finally came into the range of arrows, they did not waste any time and started shooting at me. I still did not make any big moves as I easily evaded the arrows while walking. I also swiped my claws to cut any arrows making their way towards me and they quickly realized their method of attack was a waste of effort. I took off my cloak and dropped it on the ground. 
I threw on a huge smile on my face as I started picking up pace. What? Why is he here? I could hear the commotion that was followed by my reveal. Why the hell is Tai Lung here? Is he really planning on taking all of us alone? Is he insane? I thought he was supposed to be the Supreme General. Why isn't he with his army? I smiled at their confusion as it was exactly what we planned and expected. Although it was true that it was strange to see a general fighting alone without his army, this was the best way we could win this war with the least amount of casualty. Although I have said I knew many war strategies and trained in the art of war since I was young, none of what I learned applied to the army under me. I know how to sabotage the enemies, how to plan a meticulous ambush, how to use the terrain to my advantage and so on, but none of my teachings about war applied to warfare that utilizes cannons. It was a drastic change in tactics and nature, a completely different kind of war, one which was unlike the direct confrontation between armies. So whether I was leading it or Shin was leading it, our strategy would be pretty much the same. In fact, I think it was more suitable that the creator of the weapon strategize on how to best use his weapons. I put the last train of thought away and I got on all fours before I started sprinting towards the army. My sudden change in pace caught the army off guard but the distance between us was still plentiful so they had ample time to react. Or so they thought. Do not underestimate him just because he is by himself. Remember, you are all facing Tai Lung, and if history has anything to teach us then, it is to never underestimate him. Do not hold back. Shield wall. The general of the army, a rough-looking madrill yelled out to his soldiers. I continued sprinting towards them with the speed of a cheetah. I kicked up dust and ash with every stretch of my limbs, and that told me that they had probably burned the place to clear up the vegetation in their preparation for war. The morning sun was up in the sky and lit up our battleground. We were a few kilometers apart but under the bright sky. They could clearly see me approaching as I quickly closed the distance between us. They braced for the upcoming battle and kept their eyes on my figure until suddenly, I vanished from their view. Flash steps. I moved at a speed so fast that I became a blur, which they could not see from such a distance. My movements were swift and, shockingly, I did not kick up the ash under my feet. There was no indication of my earlier existence as the place fell into absolute silence. Seconds ticked away as the soldiers turned their heads in search of me. They questioned if I was a mere illusion or a ghost as they lost sight of me. What's going on? Where is he? They asked each other. The general, on the other hand, was silent and his expression was grave. Years of instincts honed in battles won and lost screamed at him. Everyone brace yourself. The mandrel general screamed out of pure instinct and not long after. An explosion erupted from the front lines. Bodies flew out like pieces of derbies as I crashed into the shield wall they had erected. The wooden spikes and pieces of armor exploded out, injuring multiple soldiers. I had covered the few kilometers distance between us in seconds. I had a huge grin on my face and my eyes glowed bright yellow before I moved further into their ranks. Then I started wreaking havoc on the battlefield. They had no time to react and some were still not sure what was happening but I did not wait for them to catch up. Bodies started falling. I put myself in the middle of the army and started launching an all-out attack. I was careful to spare as much soldier as possible, though. After we capture the kingdom, these same soldiers were going to be our army which we would march to conquer the rest of the kingdoms. They were precious resources so I used nerve attacks as much as I could or I would cut their tendons to put them down. I was outnumbered by a huge margin so I had to make sure each swing of my limb took down multiple soldiers and every movement I made did not go to waste. I could not sacrifice one movement to take down one person so I had to get creative with the way I fought. And my mastery of all the kung fu and my unmatched knowledge in combat allowed me to do just that. I stitched together movements to create something more than just one effect, each sweep of my leg, and every swipe of my claws were done with multiple purposes. To block an incoming attack, to take down one person, to set up for the next attack, to cause distraction to the others, etc. Get him! Don't let him escape! They screamed as they finally got out of their initial shock. They swarmed at me like millions of ants. My enemies came like ocean waves as their suffocating number threatened to swallow me. Then I leapt to the sky and escaped the swarm. I kicked the air and propelled myself higher and higher into the sky. The soldier could only look up and marvel at the show of impossible feet before I changed position and shot towards the ground like a falling star. I infused chi in my attack and crashed on the ground. Boom! The attack sent out shockwaves and turned the earth into waves as they spread out and the vibration caused many to fall down while some even broke their legs. There was a shocked silence in the air as the reality of the situation settled in on everyone. 
They looked at their fallen comrades and replayed my feats of strength in their minds. A consecutive realization morphed each of their expression and it finally clicked in their mind. This was a war. A war. That means at this moment, 50,000 of them and one of me were equal and would be fighting for victory. It will not be an easy fight. The thought of capturing me or killing me with ease died in their mind. It's me against them. The weight of my name bore down on their heart. And it was heavy. It was no longer a tale they heard in the tavern. No longer a rumor someone told someone. It was more than a story. I was more than a villain the hero put down. Tai Lung. They felt the name had a new meaning to it. The scene in front of them and the name with all its reputation sink in their mind. Wawa Aya Aya. Ra. Hai A A A A Wea. They yelled out with all of their might, trying to disperse the fear and panic that slowly knocked at the back door of their heart. It was fight or die. So they charged at me with everyone they had. The battle finally starts. The war begun. Ha 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 ha, I laugh. Come at me. Tai Lung's POV, for the first few hours, I was focused on the battle. I meticulously utilized my knowledge, my techniques and strength to put down my enemies without killing them. Of course, some deaths were unavoidable but I tried my best to not waste lives. I danced around the battlefield. My movements were of calculated perfection, and each stroke of my limbs painted a beautiful scene of violence. I used different kung fu techniques to surprise and take down my enemies, and they did not stand a chance. Half a day passed and my senses were all lost. My ears had numbed due to the battle cry, which would shortly turn into screams of agony. My nose could only smell the scent of iron and blood. Both were cold. My eyes only saw the attacks thrown with every intention to kill me. Everywhere I looked, I saw threats, which I immediately addressed and neutralized before they could harm me. Being surrounded by constant danger will take a mental toll on anyone. Even when I looked up to meet the eyes of my fellow warriors, I could not see them. I only saw the opening in their defense, the gap in their armor which I could cut. They were completely dehumanized in my eyes, they were merely like dummies from a training ground which I must attack at the right moment without hesitation. Hesitation could be death. My gray fur was bathed in red and it sticks to my skin. The blood was dried and stuck to my body, making me incapable of feeling the warmth of the sun. I continued fighting. With all of my senses dulled to such an extent, it felt like a dream. I don't feel the anchor of reality as I slowly lose myself. But the difference was that my bodies moved exactly as I wanted and ordered. There was no sluggish movement or weakness. I was powerful and I took down anyone who entered my sight. I used flashsteps to move from one place to another on the battlefield. I would move away quickly before I could be swarmed and that same action was repeated for hundreds of times. I conserved my chi as much as I could but I mostly couldn't help myself from strengthening my body with it or using it to coat my nails. My breath was rhythmic as I used the sun breathing constant. I also utilized water streaming rock smashing fist as it took advantage of the opponent's strength and it saved me a lot of stamina. I was the master of force. Nearly a day passed and the fight continued even at night. At this point, I was not even thinking anymore as my body had adapted to the constant battle. I did not even have to focus or think to be in motion. My body went into autopilot and I moved with practiced ease and instinct. Even without my knowledge, I took many lives and crippled more. Fighting the battle became as natural as breathing at that point and I was able to zone out even though I continued moving and fighting. I was growing stronger. As I had thought, Battles were the best way to increase my fighting prowess as I could my techniques becoming more refined with each second the fight went on. I also got more proficient at using my chi to the point that, like I said, I could zone out and have an internal monologue while I fight. Just die, you monster. A silverback gorilla yelled and brought his giant warhammer down at me. I blurred from my position and appeared behind him as the hammer missed me by such a huge margin that it was laughable. He had a decent amount of strength though as the ground quaked under his strength. The ground exploded and instead of hurting me, he caused problems for his comrades. That's not very nice. I put my head over his shoulder and whispered in his ear from behind. His whole body twitched and he turned around and swung his hammer at me again. But he only hit the air. With how well he was armored and his strength, he must be one of the commanders. I thought to myself before an evil grin stretched my lips. I caught the silver back by the arm and after I pivoted on my heel, I threw him towards the other incoming soldiers. I also stole his giant warhammer as I sent him flying towards his subordinates. His body slammed against a dozen of the other soldiers, and I threw his warhammer in the air. He let out a groan and when he finally realized what happened, 
he hurriedly pushed himself up. But before he could do anything else, his own hammer fell on his head and he was knocked out cold. His body fell on the soldiers below again, burying them under his gigantic frame. Heh. Although he was not as heavy as Master Rhino, I reckon the soldiers would not have a fun time under him. Speaking of Master Rhino, the reason why he was so heavy was due to Chi like Mantis whose body held strength beyond his size and Po with his rubber body. Master Rhino was also way heavier than you would ever expect of his size. It was not an exaggeration when I said his swings felt like they had the weight of a mountain behind them. His heavy weight, coupled with his hammer and spinning fighting style, was a deadly combination I remembered to this day. Although I beat him seemingly easily, that was because I knew how to exploit the weakness of his techniques. In a pure contest of raw strength and power, he could rival me. That made me curious if I could have such a special body constitution. I knew it was due to Chi, but how do they achieve it? Was it due to their superior bloodline or something else? I definitely wanted a passive buff like that. I crouched down and I waited a few seconds for the soldiers to swarm on me again. It was daybreak so it was extremely dark but I had a natural night vision as a cat, so I barely even noticed the dark. When the soldiers were gonna gang up on me again, I blurred. My movement was violent like the wind as sparks erupted from different places in the dark. My claws easily ripped their armor and I cut them right at the places I wanted. When I appeared behind them again, they all fell on the ground like puppets whose strings had been cut. The battle continues. Three days after the battle had started, H-A-A, H-A-A-A, 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 the sound of my needy breath and gasps filled the broken battlefield as I stood on top of a giant pile of bodies. Some were dead while the others were unconscious. Where 50,000 strong elite soldiers once filled the area with their domineering presence, now a broken silence hung in the air. The silence was not due to the natural lack of sound, either. It was silenced. The battleground was soaked in blood, and the bodies that were scattered around were more than random pebbles. The scent of decomposing corpses also filled the place, painting a scene right out of hell. Victory is mine, I declared after catching my breath. My body was smeared in dirt and blood and beneath lies small wounds and scratches which I got from the battle. They were not lethal injuries but it shows that the fight I went through was not an easy one. But I have done it all the same. I accomplished a feat like no one had before. I slew 50,000 soldiers alone and won the battle that would take a royal army to win. The pride that was bubbling in my heart was something I thought I would never experience again. A smile tugged my lips as I basked at the reality. The reality where I was invincible. I felt at home at this moment, in this broken battlefield. With my body groaning in exhaustion and my chi reaching near depletion, I was relaxed and free like never before. Maybe, maybe this was what I was born for. Maybe this was what I was meant to do. Because this felt way better than playing the role of a hero and protecting everyone. I was meant for war, and I realized on the third day that that was not a bad thing. Some people were just born to fight and conquer. It doesn't have to make me a demon or the personification of evil either, that is just how I am, my nature. This is me. I like chasing a tall ambition and fighting with everything I had to obtain what I desired, rather than protecting what was already there and keeping everything safe. Ugwe created Kung Fu as a form of self-defense and to protect those we hold dear. But that was not what Kung Fu was to me. Instead, it was a way to being absolute. It was a form of power that allowed me to accomplish impossible feats like this and take what I wanted, even with the world opposing me. It was a weapon that allowed me to go against the universe itself. Furthermore, it was something that will never betray me, even if destiny turned her back on me. To me, that was Kung Fu. My Kung Fu. I guess Ugwe was right. There is indeed darkness in me. But if that was what I truly am, then I would embrace it instead of running away from it. After all, darkness was just as necessary as the light. It's what the symbol of Kung Fu stands for, right? Yin and Yang. The silence of the aftermath taught me who I was as I basked in my new identity. My true identity. I held up my blood-soaked hands and carefully observed it as I was about to achieve something I was struggling with for a long time. I pushed my chi out of my body but this time, instead of just calling out the uppermost layer of my white chi, I also summoned my blue chi outside. Not only that, but I let them out in equal portions and then I was easily able to control them. I let them flow from one body part to the other as I shaped my chi just as I wanted, even when they were outside of my body. It was something I was not able to do before. To think it was this simple, I said to myself. All this time, I was just letting my white chi outside, not knowing I was letting out an incomplete part of my chi that was why I had such a difficult time controlling my chi when it left my body. 
I was able to do everything when it was inside because they were complete. My white chi alone or my blue chi alone cannot work without the other. They needed to be together. They were two expressions in one chi so when I only tried to control my white chi, I was unable to do so. I just needed them to be equal and coexist to control it however I wanted. I got this enlightenment when I finally found my true identity. Do not suppress it. Let them both be free. Embrace it. I am Tai Lung. I whispered but everything heard me. I put down my hand and turned my focus in the distance where three warriors who were above the rest walked out. They have been mere spectators through the battle as they ordered the soldiers to attack me and controlled their formation as much as they could. They were hoping for me to tire out and even if I was able to beat all of the 50,000 soldiers, they hoped they would be able to take me down right after it. Tai Lung, the general of the Shu army stepped forward and started speaking. His voice was filled with fear and unadulterated admiration when he addressed my name. My name is Jean Dao, the mandrel said and bowed like a young student bowing to their master. I have served the kingdom of Shu for the most part of my life and as its loyal servant. I want to ask, no, beg you to reconsider your alliance with Lord Shen and your plan on taking over Shu Han. He asked me while bowing his head. Although he did it with such humility and determination, I could not grant his request. I'm afraid that would not be possible, I said. My ambition far exceeds what anyone had in mind and my goal is too big to abandon for the sake of one kingdom. Conquering Shu is merely a tiny portion of something grander. Jean Dao stayed silent for some time before he nodded and he looked up. I understand, Jean Dao said, but I can only plead that you will not be cruel to my beloved kingdom and its citizens. And to spare my two great commanders, I am sure it can be beneficial to your goals too, as they are great warriors. I looked at the two commanders behind him and they had grim expressions. Their plan was to fight me and hopefully take me down in my exhausted state but they knew they had no chance. So they resorted to getting my pity. He must also be hopeful in his request, seeing that I spared many of his soldiers who lay unconscious right now. With my earlier hint of a greater goal and the speech of Lord Shin, he must have put two and two together. You can be assured that no innocent lives would be harmed in my conquest. I was strong enough to promise that and I would prefer not wasting the lives of Kung Fu masters as well. But I noticed something peculiar. You never begged for your own life, I said. He sighed in relief and finally showed a smile. Words came from the East that Lord Shin is successful in his invasion. With you by his side, the kingdom of Shu is destined to fall. My loyalty lies with Shu Han forever and I plan to fall with it if I cannot protect it. It will also be a great honor to die with my brave soldiers and by your hands. I chuckled. Such a plethora of requests coming from the defeated. Please, Jean Dao said, I have fought in many great wars and won many battles. At least allow me this honor of meeting my end to a superior general. He sure knew how to butter up someone. He must have learned it from staying by his king's side. Well, I am in a good mood today, I said and leapt off the pile of bodies and landed in front of him. Consider your request granted, I said. A single second did not pass before his eyes suddenly glow bright blue and his claws extended. His mouth opened wide and displayed his sharp fangs that were longer than my fingers. He launched himself towards me with all his strength, and I just smirked at him. My chi exploded out as it coated my body, just like Monkey King did. I was finally able to replicate his enhancement fully after learning how to control my chi even when it was outside my body. My gray fur started glowing softly as I shot out like a missile. I was so fast that my movement made a sound only when I stopped behind Jean Dao. Phew womb. I stood there and flicked my hand to calm the fresh blood off them. Jean Dao had the entire vertical half of his body torn off as he fell down with a reverberating thud. It was the end of a mighty general, but also the beginning of a greater one. His two commanders immediately went to care for his corpse as I started walking away from the battlefield. Triumphed. Third POV The Great Battle of the Chengdu Plain. It was a battle where one master fought against 50,000 soldiers and came out victorious. The news spread throughout China like a wildfire. The shocking information shook the very foundation of China itself as one name resounded in the hearts of everyone. The Supreme General Tai Lung. His past feats of killing Wu Bao, defeating Master Rhino and even fighting against six members of the Kung Fu Council were forgotten as a greater feat struck the hearts of every animal. It was hard for a simple civilian to be impressed when one master defeated another master, as they did not know the true gap in strength between the ordinary and a kung fu master. So, although impressive, such news were common and never shocked anyone too much. But going up against 50,000 soldiers and coming out as the victor? 
that was something that left the people in absolute awe and worship. They may not be able to comprehend how impressive the feat of defeating six masters by one is, but they could imagine with their limited mind how impossible it was to defeat 50,000 soldiers alone. That is why Kung Fu masters were mostly known for their accomplishments in wars. Master Thundering Rhino, the Slayer of 10,000 Serpents, the Furious Five, Slayer of 5,000 Soldiers in the Battle of Weeping River. Although Master Rhino's feet seemed close to Tai Lung's accomplishment on paper, the people know the difference between bandit serpents and an elite soldier of a kingdom. The soldiers had strength they could comprehend, so it was now that they truly realized what kind of warrior Tai Lung was. The strongest. There was no doubt in everyone's mind because no one had even come close to what Tai Lung had just done. Even Master Ugwe, whose very ground they worshipped as a sacred place, had no such feat the name of the dragon warrior which had been a constant traveling tale was also discarded as the people had a more impressive tale to tell. The news only intensified when the surviving soldiers started retelling the battle that took place in vivid detail. Their stories, greatly affected by their nightmares and PTSD, were truly something else. The unification of all the kingdoms in China was first thought to be a joke and was mostly thought to be the ambition of Lord Shin. But as the story spread, the people came to learn that it was also Tai Lung's ambition, just as it was Lord Shin's. And with Tai Lung's great feat of power, the people stopped thinking that it was a mere joke. Could really happen. It was a joke when Lord Shin declared it, but after learning that Tai Lung shared the same ambition, many thought it was possible. A great change was approaching. It was the end of an epoch and the start of a new era. Tai Lung became more than a failed dragon warrior. He became more than a villain in people's minds. After all, whether they were good or evil, People couldn't help but admire the strong in a world like Kung Fu Panda. The stories about Tai Lung being evil and going on a rampage also became irrelevant when people realized his true might. He went on a rampage and did not destroy the entirety of Meilin City. He went on a rampage and the village in the Valley of Peace still existed. Stop telling lies. If he truly went on a rampage, such places would be wiped off the map. A warrior capable of rivaling 50,000 soldiers had more than enough strength to bury a city or a village. So what else could these rumors be but lies? Master Wu Bao fought bravely and managed to stop Tai Lung from destroying the city? The dragon warrior earned Tai Lung's respect after their fight? Nice joke bro. All of the previous rumors died as Tai Lung's true show of strength killed them all. People did not even want to act like they believed those in the first place. After the Battle of Chengdu Plain, there was a drastic change in the people's opinion about Tai Lung. As he had said, Kung Fu was a form of power that made things absolute. It was a weapon Tai Lung used to battle against the universe itself. He had changed his fate. Because no one remembers a villain. The people only remember Tai Lung. There was also a new nickname the people called Tai Lung. After learning of his true might and realizing that his strength could even rival a kingdom by itself, they called him the 11th power of China, the Walking Kingdom. The Supreme General Tai Lung. Third POV after Tai Lung was done with his battle, he went south and started journeying down to the kingdom of Shu. He took almost a week to finally reunite with the rest of his army. Since he took the time to heal from the battle and to also clear up any defense line the kingdom built up in the north. It was nothing compared to the 50,000 soldiers, as the army stationed there were only a few thousand. Tai Lung with his new mastery over Qi was easily able to spear through them all. By the time he met up with his army again, they had already taken over half of the territory of Shu. The battles on Lord Shun's side were also successful, as Tai Lung had already spearheaded most of Shu Han's army. Shun was absolutely ecstatic when he learned of Tai Lung's victory. He was not frightened by Tai Lung's strength or got angry to be so outshined. Instead, the peacock was over the moon. This might be confusing to some but they were already allies, so he did not even consider Tai Lung to be an enemy or possible enemy. For all his villainy, Shun was raised like a royal. The oath which was made in his name, Belief and blood on the sacred ground was permanent. He knew that Tai Lung was a great warrior who would forever respect the oath too. Just like him. Also, he had come to consider Tai Lung as something as close as a friend he had. With their shared childhood and similar stories and ambition, it was hard to not call Tai Lung his brother in arms. Like Ugwe and Kai. They had a lot of time to interact when they made plans and discussed new ways to use gunpowder for war. This was another reason why Shin liked Tai Lung, he could understand Shin. They both seemed to be made for war and conflict. They saw the explosion and power in the fireworks while the rest of the world got lost in its colors. After the Supreme General and his army finally reunited, they took another week to heal and rejuvenate themselves before they would launch the final attack towards the Kingdom of Shu. 
The war started again after a week and it was an absolute demolition on the Shuhan side. The army Shu had remaining was a mere 30,000 soldiers. Tai Lung alone could destroy them completely. The kingdom also lost its general Jin Dao and the morale amongst the soldiers could not get any worse with the reputation of Tai Lung. They realized they had no chance of winning and were only fighting to protect their honor. The other soldiers who survived the Battle of Chengdu Plain did not want to participate in the war anymore as they feared Tai Lung, so the kingdom stood no chance. After four days of marching towards the capital of Shu while also destroying any forces they sent to stop them, the kingdom finally surrendered. This only increased Tai Lung's reputation and proved his worth as a general. He not only possessed individual strength but could lead an army with ease and expertise. They did not kill anyone anymore after Shu surrendered as is stated in the codes of war and Lord Shen finally displayed his intellect in politics and was able to get the nobles of even the royal family to continue working under him. Their main ambition was to unite China and expand to the rest of the world. So Lord Shen needed help in ruling all of the territory, so he made the kingdom of Shu a vassal state. He also displayed his charisma again by delivering a speech to the people of Shu where he assured the citizens that their daily life was not going to be affected negatively in any way and that the current ruler was still going to govern them. He told them not to consider it as a loss but as a victory, because Xu was witnessing the start of a new era. It will be the first kingdom in the quest to unify China, so they should celebrate instead of being sad. Tai Lung's reputation really became vital in this part as the people believed the unification of China was possible. Instead of the loss, Lord Xin gave them a victory and won them over to his side. If they wanted to conquer the world, he knew they needed to maintain a good relation with every kingdom that comes under them. They couldn't have a civil war or conflict when they fought against the world, after all. Lord Shun and Tai Lung worked perfectly together as a team, covering each other's weaknesses. This impressive display of turning a hostile enemy into a friendly term was just a small show of Shun's ability. Although Tai Lung was a warrior, he could respect the scholar's intelligence. In total, the two of them took one month to take the whole kingdom under them. It was a display of frightening efficiency, as they just accomplished something the rest of the kingdom had been trying to do for centuries. And with the conquest of Shu Han, Tai Lung and Lord Shin completed the first step towards their ultimate ambition. Third POV. The kingdom of Nanjiao. We need to act quickly. Tai Lung and Shun are gonna come for us next. It's only a matter of time. Don't you see? The advisor of the king of Nanjiao screamed in frustration. There were many people in the courtroom as they discussed the apparent defeat of Shu and how to deal with this new, aggressive threat that had popped up beside them. I think we should wait and see how they react first. Surely they will not go for the next kingdom until they settle down properly. One of them commented, much to the annoyance of the advisor. Have you all lost your damn mind? The kingdom of Shu waited, and look what has become of them. The advisor spat it out in anger. Just say that you are afraid of Tai Lung. He yelled, cowards, cowards, all of you. The advisor, a bird species called cassowary, was a giant bird who was extremely hot-headed even though he was at the later half of his life. Calm yourself, advisor, the king said in a gentle voice. He was a beautiful golden pheasant with a calm and gentle demeanor. The advisor bit his own tongue and resisted the urge to lash out even further. He wanted to kick the heads off of all these coward nobles who knew only how to give honey words to their king when times were good but would run away instantly when their life was threatened. Boo indeed you are correct. We need to make our moves as quickly as possible. We can't wait for them to gather their forces again and attack us when they feel comfortable. In this situation, attacking is our greatest defense. He said, displaying his wisdom as king, much to the advisor's relief. This was why he had served him all this time. But is that wise my lord? One of the nobles spoke up again. Shouldn't we be aiming to ally with them or something? Can we even defeat them in a war? If Lord Shen and Tai Lung with barely a thousand strong army and the resources of a city could take over Shu in a month, imagine what they would be able to do with all the remaining army of Shu and their new resources. Could they win? They didn't think so. The advisor was fuming, considering whether he should go against his king's wishes to teach those nobles how hard he could kick. But the king raised his wings and he calmed himself down. Allying with them is not an option. They have made their intention clear when they declared war against the whole of China. The king said, and I do not appreciate your attitude in my courtroom. You may leave, the king said in a tone of finality. Guards. The noble had a sour expression as he was guided out of the courtroom and the advisor huffed at the display. He was pleased. Sorry about that. Now, returning to the discussion, the king draws and addressed his subjects. Although the odds might not look favorable to us, 
We have a good chance of winning this war if we play our cards right. Lord Shin is not the only one with an army-killing master as an ally. The king said, and a gentle smile appeared on his face. You don't mean... One of the nobles guessed and gulped. Send a messenger to Mighty Eagle. The king said, and the advisor let out a hearty laughter. Be but Master Eagle is in seclusion training to attain inner peace, and he had specifically asked not to be disturbed. Should we really force him like that? He also really gets sensitive when he feels his freedom is limited. The kingdom he swore to protect is under threat. He will respect the wish of its king. The golden pheasant said and everyone nodded, arguing no further. But that's not all. I also have another plan. The king said and his gentle smile slowly turned not so gentle. The next day, a messenger of the royal court was sent to the Tower of Heaven, which was a giant rocky mountain in the southernmost part of the kingdom. The messenger flew up the giant mountain, which was so tall that it seemed to pierce through the heavens. Not many birds could achieve such a feat in this world, and the fact that Master Eagle made it his home shows just how powerful he truly was. After a long time of struggling and flying, the messenger finally reached the place and he immediately headed inside the cave which Master Eagle used as his home. I have been waiting for you, a deep voice which was oddly high-pitched at the same time rang out. His voice sounded so wrong to the ear that it caused anyone to hear it uncomfortable. If he screeched loudly, a person's ear would surely rupture. Master Eagle, the messenger called out in awe and respect. He immediately bowed down to the mighty eagle who was turning his back on him. I heard her cry so many times over the year, so I was sure that my presence would be needed eventually, the eagle said and slowly turned around and walked forward to the light. His body was gigantic and heavy for a bird like him which should be impossible. But such things as defying simple biology was easy with the help of Chi so, who is he? Mighty Eagle asked, his piercing voice tinged with anger. It's Tai Lung, the messenger said, confused at how he was able to know so much even before he delivered the message. He also wondered who Master Eagle was referring to when he said, her. Ah, Master Eagle said as his eyes glazed over with recognition and excitement. The old cat is out of prison, huh? Master Eagle said. Interesting. Third POV, PFTTTT. I knew you would follow behind me soon enough. Jean Dao heard a voice immediately after he was brutally killed by Tai Lung. One moment he had the entire half of his body ripped off and then he felt his soul being pulled out and he found himself in this place. He slowly opened his eyes and he was greeted with an amazing sight. The world was not how he remembered it. He felt extremely light, as if all the burdens on his soul were lifted. That was not just in a physical sense either as he felt all of his worries, regrets and anger dissolving into nothing. He was in absolute peace. Oi, I'm talking to you old monkey. Maybe not absolute peace. Where are we? Jean Dao asked the monkey king, who was floating in front of him in a lazy sleeping position. Well, if you have not already deduced by now, then let me say... The Monkey King draws, shifts in the air and opens his arms. Welcome to the spirit realm, the afterlife of all the people with a mutated chi, otherwise known as Kung Fu Masters, the monkey revealed grandly. Why do you look so surprised? Did someone kill you while you sleep? Monkey King asked Jean Dao whose eyes were wide in shock. What? No! Jean Dao huffed. I died at the hands of Tai Lung because I fought to the very end. He boasted with puffed chest. What I am surprised about was seeing you here. The letter said you disappeared. It never mentioned you dying. Yeah about that. The Monkey King scratched his cheek. I found out that I couldn't survive the explosion of ten barrels of gunpowder. So you were killed by Shin and you died. Because of a powder. Jean Dao deadpanned. The Monkey King looked offended and was about to retort and give the old monkey a piece of his mind. But his words got stuck on his throat. When a green blade with chains connected to it wrapped around Jean Dao. What? Whoosh, Monkey King quickly dodged the incoming blades and moved away. His body was encased in yellow chi as he immediately turned around to look at the new guy that ambushed him. An explosion of green light enveloped the entire realm, blinding the Monkey King before the looked at the bull, who was holding a jade pendant in his hand. The pendant was carved in the shape of a mandrel. Eche, such a fine chi, the bull commented as his eyes glowed eerie green. I wonder who is sending me all of these masters from the other side. I have to make sure to thank them when I return, he said with a chuckle. Hmm. He hummed and looked at Monkey King, his eyebrow raised in interest. Especially you. You have an amazing amount of chi and the quality is refined. The bull commented, 
Maybe I will finally be able to best Ogwe after taking your chi. The Monkey King did not know what was happening, but he got ready to fight. The bull who was yet to be introduced spun his chains and threw his green blades at him. A fight began, much to the Monkey King's horror who thought he would be able to slack at least in the afterlife. Alas, he was wrong. Kai was getting stronger. He was slowly but surely getting even stronger than his canon counterpart because even though he did not get Tai Lung's chi, many other masters who did not die in canon were all dying. With the upcoming wars that Tai Lung was about to wage, surely many more Kung Fu masters would be sent into the spirit realm. It was only a matter of time until Kai became unstoppable. Although Tai Lung was getting strong, his ultimate enemy was also doing the same. Tai Lung had broken the first part of the prophecy. Will he be able to break free from the second part? Will his legacy truly die at the hands of Kai? The inevitable battle was drawing near. One that would shake the heavens and shape the universe. Tai Lung's POV, the fun and easy part, in my opinion, of conquering a new kingdom had come to an end. Now, it was time for the political and boring parts. Obviously, you can't just defeat the armies of S-Kingdom and wash your hands, thinking you are done with it. But it was for times like these that I formed an alliance with Shin, so I left everything in his hands. He had been in his throne room, writing hundreds of files and scrolls because apparently, you can't just announce the new rules and regulations that the kingdom is going to follow. Shin also had to change the constitution of the kingdom and shape it to his liking before he passed down the authority to the previous royals again. My army, on the other hand, was busy creating new cannons with the available resources of the kingdom, so I could not train them yet. That left me no duties on my shoulder. Which didn't mean that I had nothing to do, as I still needed training with my newly acquired ability, which was controlling chi outside of my body. I will be visiting the Jade Palace to get some training in before our next battle, I said to Shen, who was sitting in the throne room of the previous king. The place was filled with different scrolls and paper to paint the image of a scholar's den. How long will you be gone? Shen asked immediately because even though I said that to him, I was not asking for permission and merely notifying him. As long as you are still busy with all of these, I said and referred to all of the scrolls. A shame. He said with a sad sigh, I rather enjoyed your presence. It is not often for me to do so as I barely have friends in my life. As far as I know, you are the only one. He said with an earnest smile. Cut the bullshit. I know the real reason you want me to stay is to ensure safety in case the other kings decide to attack before things settle down. I said, perhaps. But who said there has to be only one reason I want you to stay? You don't have to worry about it. We respect the codes of war and so will they. I said in a firm tone. That is quite naive. Coming from you, it's not naive. It's called having an honor. I said, and even if they decided they no longer want to respect the codes of war, they will quickly change their mind on the matter after I drop into their capital city and turn it into hell. I see. Shin smiled. That assures me a little. I grunted in reply as he should. They will be the ones who suffer if the codes of war are discarded. So, what is the main problem that you are having that it made even your mind stagnant? I asked curiously when I saw the dark circles under his eyes. I knew he was working hard. But was it to the point that he didn't even sleep? He sighed, it's everything. I have to make sure everything is perfect so that our empire will not crumble in the future. I need to force order to the kingdom and give the previous ruler his power back while making sure that they wouldn't rebel in the future. The king might want his revenge. The nobles have their own agenda for the sake of profit and the citizens are in chaos. Opinions clashed. Shen said with a shake of his head. Sounds rough. It is. Shen said but he smiled at the end. I like the trouble though. It's a constant reminder of our success. The first step to the impossible. I just need to implement a new system of government first before anything else. He said with a thoughtful hum. Why don't you let the citizens choose their ruler? I blurted out when I heard he needed a system of government. Shin paused. What? Nah. Forget about it. I said with a shrug. The idea of democracy or something similar would be too foreign for them. It was a bad idea. I just named the most popular government of the modern world when he said he needed a government system. No. Shin said and his eyes went wide and focused. I could literally see his mind working faster than most would even thought possible. Yes. He drawls and nodded. Yes, it could work. Why don't I let the people choose their ruler? He repeated, that will shift their focus and they would be busy debating on who should rule them rather than if it was a good idea to be under us. It will give them a new thing to chew on. And why not let the noble houses be eligible to be the rulers? Sow conflicts between them and the king so that revenge against us will be a distant dream. Those nobles will never let go of a chance to rule, of course. They will still be ultimately under us but our presence won't matter much if we are constantly expanding our empire. I did not think that far but sure. Anyways, if that's done, I will be leaving, I said. Oh, of course, Shin said with a smile. Although the idea of you training when you are already this strong is quite a horrifying idea, 
I wish you luck. I gave a final nod before I went out of the room and leapt out of the balcony. I leapt into the air and propelled myself upwards and shot across the sky. It didn't take me long to reach the Jade Palace. Boom! Boom! The ground shook as I did a superhero landing on the training ground. I stood up just in time for the Furious Five and Purr to run out of the training hall to see me. Well, yellow there, juniors. Master Tai Lung. Po was the first one to run up to me, followed by the others. Oh my gosh, we've heard the news. You are so freaking awesome, Po said and raised his arm. Tell me, tell me, what was it like? Did you have to go all out, or were the 50,000 soldiers just a warm-up for you? Is it true that the Monkey King is dead? Monkey asked me as he came up from behind. How are the citizens of Shu? Are there any problems with the new administration? Crane asked thoughtfully. Welcome home. Tigress was the only one without question as she folded her arm and looked at me with a smile. I raised my hand to stop all the chattering and questions. They went silent and I stared at them with my intense eyes. You guys are talking a lot. Let's see if you can do more than that. I said and stomped on the ground as a gust of wind erupted from me, blowing them away. I came back to the Jade Palace to train, and what better way to do so than spar with these six? It will not only help me but help them as well. It's a win-win situation. Besides, I wanted to see how much they improved, especially Tigris and Pa. Instead of telling, let me show you how I took down an army by myself. I chuckled and cracked my neck before I blurred from my position and grabbed Crane's neck. He was the only one that could fly and the main brain of the team so he should be taken out first. Why always me? Crane choked out as I slammed him on the ground. The spar slash training started. Tai Lung's POV Chi, the fuel of miracles. If you were amazed at what I could achieve with it when it was limited inside my body, you would be horrified to learn what I could do with it now that I can control and shape it to my liking outside of my body. It brought my combat prowess to a whole new realm. Obviously, it was not usable in a real fight with my current proficiency because a battle of my caliber happened in the blink of an eye and one millisecond could dictate death and victory. But when I finally mastered the use of my chi to such a level that I could use it during battle, then I will confidently declare that I stood shoulder to shoulder with the likes of Ugwe. The same principles applied to my chi when it was outside of my body and it meant that just like before, I was extremely versatile and creative with the way I was using my chi I did more than just grow trees or make a dragon construct which I can shoot around. I can do something like this, I said to myself with a smile. I brought my hands up and from my palm, a blue flame was burning with frightening intensity. There was one world that came to my mind when I realized I could control my chi when it was outside of my body and affect the world around me. The world of Avatar. The warriors there were capable of manipulating the four elements and their variants to their will. Without the proper guidance, I had a hard time achieving the same feats as they did but I was slowly getting there. I was learning through trial and error, but it wouldn't be long until I could bend the elements as they did in their world. Sometimes, I would forget that you are a monstrous genius and times like this are a reminder, Shurfu commented as he stood not too far away. He had been supervising my training since the very start, and I allowed him because it was very helpful to him. He had already attained inner peace so mastering chi was his next journey too. Really? I asked with an obvious answer while I clenched my fist to put out the flames. Yes, I've never heard of or seen Master Ugwe achieve such impossible feats. Like conjuring blue flames, creating a rotating ball of energy that can destroy boulders, or that technique you made recently. The one that ruptured a mountain, Shurfu said with a curious stroke of his beard. He must be talking about my fire bending, raising Gan and the last one. These techniques are something you created in only a week of training as well. The potential you hold is something that will terrify any master. My son, Shurfu said and the smile on his face could not have been prouder. Has it already been a week again since I came to the Jade Palace? It feels way shorter when you are busy putting all your mind into training. I have not even had a wink of sleep yet as I meditated instead, trying to get a better feel of my chi or otherwise just letting my body interact with my chi of course. But you only name techniques which are destructive in nature. You can't only have destruction. Sometimes you need to heal and give life. I said and put out my hand near the small seedling plant on the ground. I willed my chi outside my palm and it released a bluish glow. My chi affected the small plant and I allowed it to grow. Not long after, the plant grew and turned into a beautiful flower. What was used as an energy to fuel destruction can also be used to fuel life. You can change the nature of your chi according to your will. But one thing I noticed was that whenever I was using my chi, if it was to fuel destruction, my white chi would react enthusiastically whereas my blue chi seemed more fluid when I was about to fuel a restoration or healing technique. A curious thing but in the end, they need to be equal output to work so it didn't really matter. That was one thing which annoyed the shit out of me. I needed to focus on my chi and make sure that they were in equal proportion or the technique will not work. The more unequal they are, the harder it is to control. That means at the moment, I cannot use chi outside of my body on instinct. Which means I cannot utilize it in real combat just yet. 
I would need someone to distract my enemy so that I can have enough time to concentrate to execute my technique. In that regard, I was kind of like a mage who needed some time to create spells. That, I can do too. Shurfu said with a smile before he did the same thing, making a flower grow until it blooms. That was all he could do, though. Strangely enough, neither Pa nor Shurfu had been able to replicate any of the techniques I took from my knowledge of another world. I could understand my father, but for Pur to be unable to copy my techniques too, it made me believe I may be special for a moment. It could just be their incompetence, though, rather than being impossible for anyone else but me to achieve such things. It left me with myriads of questions again. The initial reason why I could invent such techniques was because I have the knowledge and because I have seen other people perform it in my past life. So I thought inventing was my only advantage. I thought other people would eventually be able to copy my techniques as well after they see me do it, but that seemed to be not the case so far. I need further time to test my theory though. If it is true, then that means there was something special about me which others didn't have. Chi was the fuel of miracles, and I have been able to achieve impossible things with it. I wonder, was it not the same for other people? Maybe it is, but was mine more potent because I have two chi? Where are the students? I asked as I could not hear them close by. I also took in the air and analyzed the different scents in the air. Theirs were absent. I have sent them on a mission. Bandits and pirates have been very active in the west after the fall of Shu. So I sent them there to deal with it. I raised my eyebrow and my ears perked up. I did not hear any such news while I was in there. I said with a low growl. If bandits and pirates were terrorizing my land, it was my responsibility to deal with them. Not the students of the Jade Palace. Obviously they are not suicidal. They would have never attacked if you stayed there. They started making moves only when they realized you were gone. I clicked my tongue. My status was at the point where my mere presence had a negative effect even if I didn't do anything. The things I could do were enough to scare my enemies off. No need to get all upset. Your junior can handle it easily, and I thought it would be better to not disturb you with such things while you were in the middle of training. Shurfu said. Thank you. Although it was unfortunate that Poe was not here. I was planning on finally revealing the hidden panda village which still exists today and his father who was continuously looking for him. I thought it would be good for Purr to have a family reunion and relearn the ways of a panda without Kai looming above their fate. Oh well, I could just do that when he returns. Father. I called out, much to the surprise of Shurfu. But it was because I wanted to request something. Mind a light sparring? I asked. Calling me father only when you have something you want from me? Spare this old panda's feelings. He said with a fake sad face. It is what it is. I said. He was going to accept my proposal anyway, even if I did not call him father. I launched myself at him as we started having a light sparring which quickly escalated to a small fight. First rule of martial arts, there is no light sparring. It is a myth, I have been learning so many new techniques in the only span of one year that it nearly got to the point that it nearly had a negative effect on my combat power. Many people would assume that since I have learned so many powerful techniques, I would be so much stronger but in truth, I was indeed stronger but not by much. It is like giving a machine gun to someone who has been using a pistol all his life. Of course, a machine gun was better, but the sheer proficiency he had with a pistol before made it so that the difference was not much. This will continue until he becomes as proficient with the machine gun as he was with the pistol. Likewise, I have been changing up my fighting style and adding multiple new techniques, which while making me stronger was not at its fullest potential. I needed more experience. So a fight or a spar like this was always welcomed. We continued fighting for half a day, exchanging blows as we fought in the sky, on the hill, on the training ground, etc. We would have gone one if not for the messenger bird that suddenly decided to pay a visit. He had a letter for me. Who was the one that sent you? I asked as I took the message scroll from his hand. I quickly opened up to read the contents while he answered. It's from Lord Shin, Great General Tai Lung. My eyes narrowed as I quickly read the contents of the scroll, and the permanent scowl on my face deepened. A soft yet big growl rolled off my throat and vibrated out into the surroundings. It made the surrounding air flee as a cold wind blew over the place. Really now? I said as I crushed the scroll in my hand. Shurfu who was standing beside me, and was also peeking at the letter, had a worried look wash over his face. My anger swiftly got tainted with slight amusement as dark chuckles rolled off my throat. A consecutive attack on both the capital of Shu and Gongmen City. The armies are marching towards us right now. Yes, armies. The other kingdoms have united. Third POV, three weeks ago. In the southernmost city of the kingdom Nanjiao, an important meeting unlike anything that had ever happened before, was taking place. The building was the castle of the city, but the weird thing about it was that everything was quiet, which meant that there were not many people in that castle even though it was massive. There were no servants, there were no soldiers, and there were no residents. In the main room of the castle, seven people were occupied with each other, and they were also the only people in the whole castle. There was a palpable tension in the air. 
The presence of these individuals was so massive that it took over the whole castle, making the empty rooms have the weight of being occupied. There was silence, but their presence was so heavy that anyone would be able to tell that someone was in the castle. So, is anyone going to say something or are we going to continue observing each other and wait for the other to attack? Said a tiger who had a robust physique, but his scholar clothes would tell you that he was not a warrior. He was just blessed with a great body and supernatural strength since birth. He was the king of the South Kingdom, Dali. I think it's for the bird to decide, he was the one who called this meeting. I was going to reject it at first, but he promised in the name of his kingdom that it was going to be worth our while. Said a crocodile wearing a luxurious golden robe. His scales also have rubies and golden webs between them to show his wealth. He was the king of the Central Kingdom Tang. Could you please get to the point quickly? I have my harem to attend to. The tiger, the king of Dali said with a tired yawn that seemed to show his carefree attitude which was exactly opposite to how he actually felt. I am glad you can all make it. The golden pheasant, the king of Nanjiao said. This was the other plan that he had besides giving orders to Mighty Eagle. He was about to do something drastic to make sure that Lord Shin and Tai Lung were forever gone from this world. That was how much of a threat they posed to the world, at least in his eyes. Getting the two kings in one room was no easy feat, however he was somehow able to do it. An event like this where more than two kings had a meeting was 20 years ago so it was not a common occurrence at all. Though, the kings were accompanied by their general and their strongest warrior. The bird king of Nanjiao eyed the two warriors who stood behind their respective kings. They were strong, but he was not outdone by them, as behind him was Master Eagle, also known as Mighty Eagle. He was simply standing there but his whole presence seemed to loom over them as the two warriors the kings brought seemed to be on edge. So when he spoke, the king of Nanjiao did so with confidence. I want to form an alliance. Silence. Then laughter. Ha 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 The tiger and the crocodile, the king of Dali and the king of Tang, started laughing hysterically as the sound echoed through the empty castle. The laughter was not fake or overdone either, it was genuine. Oh God, please don't tell me that's why you called us both here, the tiger said between laughter. This is too goddamn funny. Do you take us for fools, oh great golden pheasant? Ha ha ha. I came here, wondering what the falling king wanted at his deathbed, but this is just ridiculous, the crocodile said, wiping his tears. The falling king. The kings of Dali and Tang were no fools. They knew that Lord Shin and Tai Lung were coming after Nanjiao next after they conquered Shu. There were ten powers in China before, which were the ten kingdoms. Now, things have changed slightly with Shu being taken over by Shin. Although Shu lost many of its soldiers, Shun's weapon made it so that it was still a proper power. And then there was the new eleventh power of China, Tai Lung, the Walking Kingdom. So if you think about it, it's two great powers versus one. Therefore, the kingdom of Nanjiao has a very low chance of defending itself against Lord Shin and Tai Lung. That was why he was called a Fallen King. Now, he wants the three of them to form an alliance so that they can fight against Shin and Tai Lung? No chance. If they did decide to form an alliance, it would be three great powers versus two and they have the advantage, but it won't be an easy war to win either. They will lose all of their resources. Or, the King of Dali and the King of Tang can wait until the end of the war between Lord Shin and Tai Lung with the Kingdom of Nanjiao. Then, in the aftermath, when the winner is at its weakest, they will strike. With enough preparation, Nanjiao will be able to put up a decent fight, unlike the Shu who was caught off guard. So Tai Lung and Shen will suffer many losses even if they win. That will be a great time to swoop in and reap all of the advantages with the least amount of loss. So why? Why in the heaven and earth would they want to ally with the kingdom of Nanjiao when not allying with them will give more reward with minimum loss? No X2, the king of Dali and Tang, said in unison as they rejected the proposal for an alliance. Not only was it not beneficial to them, an alliance between kingdoms had not happened in a thousand years. There was nearly one twenty years ago but that was stopped by Tai Lung before a great war starts. The answer is and has always been obvious. No. Oh well, too bad then. The king of Nanjiao, a golden pheasant, said. I would have preferred forming an alliance with you two instead of surrendering to Shun and Tai Lung. Such a sad thing, the bird said with a sigh, but there was a smile on his face. What? The king of Dali said out loud proving himself to be the worst king at hiding his true emotions between them. So he was planning to surrender to the enemy without even fighting them? That changes everything. Now, if there was no fight between them, how would they take advantage of the aftermath and strike when Shun and Tai Lung are weak? Forget about them being weak, it would make them much stronger with the army of Shu and Nanjiao under their banner. If that happens, Tai Lung and Shun would continue expanding their power immediately, and who were they coming next? It was them. The kingdom of Dali and the kingdom of Tang will be their next victim as the kingdom closest to them. That realization sent a chill down the king's spine. The king of Nanajiao basically said, double it and give it to the next person. Have you no honor? The king of Dali, Tiger, asked. In his eyes, 
Surrendering to an enemy even without fighting back was the most cowardly thing a king or warrior could do. Even if you were weaker, die trying and go out in glory. So the kingdom of Nanjiao surrendering was not even a possibility he considered. My honor lies in ensuring the future of my kingdom. The bird said, I also heard that Shen is actually appointing the previous rulers to continue ruling the kingdom. The only difference will be that they will be under the authority of Shen and Tai Lung. It might even mean getting into their good side so I do not mind giving up like a coward. If it saves the lives of my people, so be it. I am not sending my soldiers to die in a battlefield that promised no victory. The room went quiet as they listened to his words. Although his action was not traditional, they had respect for his beliefs and motives. So, what's it going to be? The king of Nanjiao asked again. If I don't win, I will make sure both of you don't either. If I lose, I will drag you both with me. That was basically what the situation was. Both of the kings know that if Nanjiao actually surrenders without a fight, there will be three powers against them. Army of Nanjiao, Tai Lung, and Lord Shin with his army and weapons. They won't win, that's for sure. Cunning bastard, the crocodile said with a shake of his head. Let's talk about how we are going to divide the spoils and the lands first. He continued with an annoyed smile. That was all but a confirmation that they would likely accept the proposal. In the end, they were able to settle on the rewards in a way that all of them were satisfied. The kingdom of Nanjiao will get the entirety of the land of Shu. But in return, she would give some of her territory to the kingdom of Dali. The lands which the Dali were always envious of would be theirs. And Tang will get Gongmen City. The land was not massive but the economy was something that would be arguably more beneficial. I accept the alliance. I accept the alliance. After a thousand years, three of the ten kingdoms have united against a common enemy. There was no doubt in their mind that they would win with this. Tai Lung is the main problem here, as he alone has strength that could rival a kingdom. We take him out and then the rest would be much easier, said the bird, King of Nanjiao. Any plans? Crocodile said. King of Tang, we will march towards Gongmen City and try to capture it. Most of Lord Shin's forces are in Shu right now, so the army will not be able to come in time to defend it. In this case, Tai Lung will be forced to protect the city, said the bird. We will send a huge portion of our forces to Gongmen City along with our most powerful warrior, Mighty Eagle, Master War Turtle and Master Tiger. Then we make sure to take out Tai Lung for good. A walking kingdom cannot be allowed to exist. You mean we march towards a city full of civilians, and that too without notifying the rulers so that they could deploy forces to defend it? That would be a war crime and a breach in the codes of war, said Tiger, the king of Dali. Ugwe is dead, so a small breach like this could be overlooked. It's not a huge war crime like poisoning the enemy's food source either, so we should be fine. And are you sure you want to let Tai Lung grow until he becomes like Ugwe? If we don't kill him, not, that's what he will become. The bird said, right? There will be no one to complain after we are done either, said the crocodile. The meeting went on for a few days until the plans were finalized. It has been decided. And then the three kingdoms made their move. Tai Lung's POV, what is it, son? Shurfu's voice brought me out from the dark side of my thoughts. Three kingdoms have united, Nanjiao, Dali, and Tang. They have decided to launch an all-out attack on us, I said and put down the scroll. That's, Shurfu draws in shock. I could not blame him as it was truly astonishing that three kingdoms had formed an alliance which had not happened in a thousand years. It was not rare for two kingdoms to team up against one kingdom, in which case the enemy also allies with another to counter this force. That would make it a war in which four kingdoms participated, and more than that would be a direct breach of the codes of war. That was why this situation was new and dangerous. Will you be okay? Shurfu disregarded all the other questions swirling in his mind, and that was the first sentence he uttered after hearing the news. His voice laced with concern would have made me blush if anger was not boiling under my skin. I'll be fine, I said, but will they? The scroll stated that a huge army which consisted of these three kingdoms was already making their way to Gongmen City and would reach there in less than three days. For reference, I took five days to reach Gongmen City from central China, where Tang was located. I was already fast and with their army, they should have taken triple that time. Yet, Shin said he only found out a few days ago and was not even aware that they had formed an alliance, so he just thought they were moving their army to the border of their territory to prepare for us. So it was a sneak attack, something which directly goes against the codes of war. An alliance of three kingdoms should have been announced immediately. Even the alliance between Shin and I was announced to the world the very next day. Their action was not to the point that it could be called a serious war crime and they should face the consequences, but it was also not innocent. If I had to make a comparison, it was like dirty boxing, which the referee did not notice. So I was angry, which was not good for anyone, because then I will not fight to win, but to hurt. I will be leaving now. It's unfortunate that our time had to be cut like this, I said. But before I walked away, 
I discussed something extremely important with Sherfu. The conversation was not long though as I left soon after. Messenger, I called the pigeon and he came to me with uncertain steps. Yes, my lord, fly back to Shun and tell him to focus on defending Shu. I said, Gong Men is safe. Then I leaped into the air and using flash steps, I made my way to the metropolis city which once rejected me. They want to take over Gong Men city? They will do no such thing while I am breathing. Even if I have to bear the might of the three great powers, it will not happen. Swoosh! My body sliced through the atmosphere as I used the intangible as a foothold. A snow leopard was not meant to fly, one warrior was never meant to face an army and a villain was never meant to protect. But I did anyway. I care not of what was or is meant to be. No physical trait, no logic or label would define me. I surpass all. I am Tai Lung. My legs stilled as I stopped using flash steps. But not only was I not falling, but the speed at which I flew was faster. I used Hing Kung to make myself weightless, as I bent the air around me so that it pushed me forward. I was unshackled and free. Not only that, but I am a master of Qi so I flew. Third POV. The army from Nanjiao is slowly marching and invading our territory. The soldiers stationed at the Bantong River were defeated. Boss Wolf reported to Shin. How are we going to proceed, my lord? Should we continue playing defensive? Or should we launch an attack while disregarding Gongmen City? The attack from Nanjiao came from the furthest side of the west, which meant that if Lord Shin were to send his army to repel the invaders, it would be impossible to march back and reach Gongmen in time to save it. So right now, Shun has not deployed his army yet and is waiting for the news from the messenger. Splitting his army into two was a choice, but that would make his chance of victory plummet massively. Even if he were to match the invading force of Nanjiao with half his army, the enemy kingdom would just send more forces and double down, knowing the other half of Shun's army went to defend Gongmen city. And the army he sent to Gongmen would only reach the city when the soldiers who remained there to protect the city were heavily weakened, making it almost impossible to take back the city. It was a well-planned strategic attack which was crafted to make Shin completely helpless. Even the cunning bird would have actually been left helpless had he not allied with Tai Lung. But he was, so there was hope. Send the gorillas to create obstacles. Use the explosives to cause a landslide or collapse some mountains, I don't care. Just make sure to slow down their movements. Shun said. His voice would have been frustrated and angry a few months ago, but he was eerily calm right now. That was because what was happening was something within Shun's expectations. He was not frustrated and instead, B was actually pleased with the development. Things were getting annoying, as it was hard for the people of Shu to accept Shin and Tai Lung as their new rulers. But this attack gave them an opportunity to make it so that the people would accept. If they were to come out victorious and successfully defend the land, it would cause the people of Shu to have a change of heart. After all, you can't hate your savior. And it will also instill loyalty to the army of Shu. What else would be better to cultivate their loyalty than leading them to victory against their main rival, which was Nanjiao? There was always a silver lining in every situation, and Shun was experienced in finding that silver lining. Just look at how he took over Gongmen city after Tai Lung destroyed his warehouse or how he formed an alliance with him instead of making him an enemy when he captured his students. But the silver lining in this situation will only happen if they somehow come out victorious in this conflict. Which Lord Shin was sure would be the case. Because he was not alone anymore in his fight against the world. Tell me, have you gotten information on the forces that are currently heading towards my city? Shin asked and Boss Wolf lowered his head in shame and hesitance. No, my lord. We do not know the exact numbers, as none of our scouts returned. But we suspect it to be massive and all of the three allied kingdoms had sent their army. He said, the fact that none of our bird scouts have returned also indicated that Mighty Eagle is amongst them, killing off every aerial animal. So their main focus is taking over Gongmen City, huh? The attack from Nanjiao is likely meant to be a distraction. Lord Shin thought to himself, it was a great move from the enemy which was applaudable. If they take over Gongmen City, then the army would have an extremely easier time invading Shu as they would just have to follow Shin's previous path. The walls and the defensive tower Shin felled in his quest to conquer Shu had still not been restored. So they must be planning to invade from the already cleared path. Have Master Ox and Croc reached Gongmen City? Shin inquired, to which he got an affirmation. As the guardian of the city, Master Ox and Croc were the first to run back to the city to protect it. They must be feeling extremely guilty and complicated which was exactly what Shin wanted. They were the ones who provided the information that Tai Lung left Shu to the enemies. There was no other explanation for how well-timed the attack from the Three Kingdoms was. As mentioned before, the Kung Fu Council was the ally of any enemy that Shin had. They must feel betrayed, as the Kung Fu Council was helping the kingdoms capture Gongmen City. Lord Shin was already pushing it, but they could understand since he was the heir, but they would not allow the city to be used and owned by the other kingdoms. After this, Shun hoped that they would be loyal to him. They were valuable warriors and although at first he kept them alive to control the flow of information the enemy received, 
it would be better if they completely became his. Lord Shin and Boss Wolf continued discussing different matters. Shin went through reports after reports and quickly thought of a solution to any problem that arises. But their talk was interrupted by the sound of flapping wings coming from the balcony. The messenger which Shin sent to Tai Lung has returned. Did you find him? Shin asked the messenger immediately. Yes, my lord. And he has received your scroll. So, General Tai Lung said to focus on defending Shu and that Gong Men is safe. Shin started laughing madly when he heard that. He was expecting Tai Lung to request at least a few thousand soldiers, but it seemed he was planning to do things alone again. Tai Lung will only have the army stationed at Gong Men to repel off the invading forces of the Three Kingdoms. The damned feline was as crazy as him. But fine, Lord Shin will trust him. Did you hear what your Supreme General said? Stop worrying about Gong Men and gather the army to face against the Nanjiao. Shin said to Boss Wolf. We are going to take over Nanjiao. Shin said with an evil smile. Defend Shu. That was what Tai Lung had said. But how can Shin not surpass his expectations when he had surpassed Shin's expectations multiple times? They wanted to take his city from him. But instead, he will take over their kingdoms while they are busy fighting against Tai Lung. But for that, he will need to bring out his new weapon. A weapon he had created with the idea Tai Lung had given him. Bring out the airships. The three kingdoms had made a move and launched an attack to destroy Tai Lung and Shin. But now they will fight back. The war begins. Tai Lung's POV I flew above Gongmen City and carefully observed it from afar. Just like you would expect a city which was about to be invaded to react, they were doing it. The city was in absolute chaos. While the city itself was eerily quiet with the citizens locking themselves up in their houses, waiting for the disaster to pass by some miracle, the exit gate of the city was packed as many people wanted to leave the city. Both were an understandable reaction to the impending battle. While the citizens were going to be unharmed in the upcoming conflict, if the codes of war were followed, their new rulers would more likely than not demand war tax from them. This was especially likely for Gongmen City, which was the home of many rich animals from all over China. And the fact that trade had stopped in the city was a huge turnoff to most residents. So these people wanted to move out of the city as quickly as possible. I ignored the city itself and made my way to the army barracks which was stationed a little far away from the city. When I finally reached there, I stopped using my chi and fell to the ground like an asteroid. Boom! I crashed into the earth as my feet were planted deep into the ground. But I showed no reaction, and I easily stepped out of the crater. The army quickly came out of the camps with their weapons, ready to kill any invader but they stilled on their spot when they saw me. I took a look around the barracks and immediately noticed the sober mood of the place. A soldier's barracks should be lively like a tavern, as there were none who were more appreciative of life and every day than soldiers who walked with death each day. But the barracks which I stood at was the opposite of what you would expect. It felt more like a hospital or a graveyard, with the ghosts of negative feelings haunting the place. Why are you guys so quiet? Are you all scared? I asked the wolves with a small smile on my face. The majority of the army who were left in Gongmen City were directly under Lord Shin and me. They were also the ones whom I spent a week training so they were the closest soldiers to me. I let my chi erupt out and started affecting the environment. It was like a drop of rain falling on a pond and creating small waves that spread out everywhere. My will pressed down on the surroundings, and even if they didn't see me, everyone in the vicinity was told of my presence. It was not one of threat but a reassuring one. They had nearly been forced to a fate where they would fight an impossible battle they would never win. So their dull mood and eerie barracks was understandable. But that stops now. Be not afraid, I said. My voice infused with chi was carried by the wind to every ear. Your general is here. Wow a ah ah. Lord Tai Lung. The soldiers all came out and erupted into cheers. Their previously dull eyes now held a spark of hope. They must have heard of my tales even from Gongmen City. So seeing me was a huge relief in their heart. These were the times when reputation became a vital weapon. Because with only my presence and a few words, I was able to turn their situation, their reality upside down and boost their morale. Turn despair into hope, fear into courage, and anxiety into excitement. The first battle in a war takes place in the heart of the soldiers. And that was one. Tai Lung's POV, it took me only a few hours to reach Gong Men City from the Jade Palace. Which means I had around three days to prepare for the enemy to reach us. I gathered all of the soldiers in the barracks and gave them a short speech to boost their morale before telling them to get ready to march east. We will meet the enemy beyond the Pearl Lake. After I was done, I went to the city and with the help of some of the noble houses there, I was able to calm down the people from panicking too much. With my reputation, it was not hard for them to believe that I would be able to protect them and defeat the army. The Supreme General was here, they told themselves. But many people still insisted on leaving the city. Trade had also stopped for a while now, and the economy of the city was quickly plummeting. Is this what you want? I asked while I ate the fish dish before me. I was in Mr. Lee's restaurant again, and Officer Chaucer lookalike chef was also there with me. 
he did not know how to react to the situation. I thought that with all the things the city has done for you, at least you would have the honor and not go this far. I said to Gazelle who was lying on the ground, paralyzed from her neck down. She owned almost all of the brothels and male entertainment in Gongmen City. So when Shin took over the city, he decided to let her stay and operate under him. She was always more independent than she was with the Kung Fu Council, so we decided to let her stay in the city, as her value outweighed her annoyance. It was similar to how we kept Master Ox and Croc alive and fighting for us. Not only were they useful, they were a link to our enemy. As Sun Tzu said, keep your friends close and your enemies closer. I, I didn't do anything, she spat out in a voice still full of defiance. Do you take me for a fool, gazelle? I asked and used my feet to prop up her chin. Look at me, I told her and she did. Her eyes started shaking and her paralyzed body trembled. Like it was mentioned before, she had the innate ability to observe a person's strength. It was almost like how prey could differentiate predators from the rest. She already said I was the strongest person she had ever seen last time, but now that I had gotten stronger again and also learned to control my chi properly, I wonder what she saw. Say that again while looking at me. She couldn't. I'm curious. You have everything to gain if you work with us. So why did you decide to make yourself an enemy? I thought you were not even that close with the Kung Fu Council. I asked. She was born and lived in Gongmen City, and the reason she even associated with the Kung Fu Council in the first place was because they became rulers of the city. So it was a genuine question why she decided to still work with them. Go to hell. She grits her teeth. Wow, I felt some hate in her voice. Is it personal, then? Don't tell me you were secretly in love with Master Rhino, and you now want to avenge him or something. I said with a laugh, and her reaction made me feel like that might be true. Or was it just her acting? Choosing to make this the truth to avoid telling the real reason. The Ho falls in love with the ruler of the city, but she never even had the courage to show her feelings because she feels unworthy. She never allows herself to be touched by him because she thinks she will taint him and believes that her love for him is special and not lust. But then Shin killed him before she even confessed. Blah blah blah. Sounds like a really shitty novel. I continued to entertain her for a bit more minutes before my plate finally became empty. And with my fish gone, so was my pleasant mood. I grabbed Gazelle by her horns and threw her across the restaurant. She crashed into the wall and fell to the ground. She immediately coughed out blood. I pushed her head down on the ground and used my claws to cut the floor in front of her. Now here is what we are going to do. I said, you are going to tell me everything that I want to know. Starting with how strong the alliance between the three kingdoms are, how many soldiers are marching towards the city and how many masters are coming with them. She glared at me. I always thought she was someone clever but maybe hatred had made her dumb. But the glare will quickly turn into one of submission soon. To know your enemy was half the battle won. Luckily, there was literally walking meat of information under me. As the result of this battle would dictate the fate of everything, I cannot take any chances. I will not lose. Tai Lung's POV 200,000 soldiers. Now that is not a funny number. That was probably the whole military might of two entire kingdoms. The reason why there were so many foot soldiers was mostly because of Tang, which was located in the center of China. The Jade Palace was there, so central China was the most peaceful part of China. Therefore, they had more infantry compared to other kingdoms since there was no constant war where they could lose soldiers, but in return, their soldiers were less experienced. But they should not be underestimated. It was an incredibly reckless move to dispatch 200,000 strong warriors to take over one city, even if they expected me to protect said city. Nay, reckless was not enough. It was a straight-up insane move. So what could they possibly achieve with 200,000 soldiers? That number was so staggering that it would be more inconvenient rather than helpful. Instead, it would even be better to dispatch 50,000 soldiers in waves rather than 200,000 soldiers at once. Unless, their main objective was not to take over the land but something else. A task that requires 200,000 soldiers attacking at once, rather than your typical war. A crazed smile split my face. Their main objective was not to take over the city and launch an attack on Shu from there. No, it was never about the unmoving territory which they could conquer any time. Their true target was the walking kingdom, me. The main goal of the three allied kingdoms was not to take over Gongmen city. It was to kill me. Ha 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 ha. My laughter spread throughout the restaurant and silenced every other sound. Gazelle was unconscious beside my feet. As I had knocked her out after I learned everything I wanted. But that was not all. 200,000 soldiers was not enough to kill me, although I would never do it. Fleeing after fighting with everything I had was a possible reaction. So they sent Mighty Eagle and other Kung Fu masters with them. Among all of the names Gazelle had given me, four of them stood out. 1. Master White Tiger, aka the greatest warrior, the strongest warrior in all of Dali and he was an old rival of Tai Lung, one he had already humbled in the past. 2. Master Yu Chao Wang, aka the Turtle Monk, 
the strongest warrior and guardian of the Tang Kingdom. He was one of the few students of Ugwe himself and was said to be related to the creator of Kung Fu. His age is unknown. 3. Mighty Eagle, aka Vanquisher of Armies or King of the Sky. He is the strongest warrior of Nanjiao and a guardian. He was equal if not more powerful than the Monkey King himself. 4. Master Sloth aka the brain of the Kung Fu Council. He was known for his intelligence rather than his strength. He is said to be the smartest commander in all of China. These people would be the final nail in the coffin in defeating me. With Mighty Eagle there, running away also became impossible even if I could fly. They really were going all out. They knew the main backbone was me and they knew Lord Shin was someone they could deal with easily if I was gone. After learning exactly what enemy was marching my way, I realized it was a poorly hidden challenge towards me. They dared. I said as my eyes showed a threatening yellow. I wonder, do they really believe they can kill me with this? Not only that, but I admit, I would have stood no chance if it was before I mastered Chi but now it was different. I had a chance to not only come out alive, but absolutely demolish them. But even then, it won't be easy. It was a challenge, an obstacle before me and I was certain I would come out stronger than ever on the other side. So what else can I do as the strongest warrior except, except the challenge? I ordered the soldiers to take Gazelle and put her in prison while I went towards the Tower of Sacred Flames to prepare. The plan was still the same, me and the 2,000 soldiers under me would be fighting against the Allied Kingdom. And we won't be shy and play defensive either, we would march towards them and meet them head-on like equals. I realized that it was no longer about protecting the city after learning their true motives. It would be all about kill or be killed. They wanted to kill me, huh? I hope they took a page from Wu Bao and came prepared to meet the same fate. Third POV, we're moving too slow, the turtle monk said, and that should say something coming from a turtle, relax he won't go anywhere. He has nowhere to hide, and he is not one to run either, Master White Tiger said with a carefree yawn. They were both standing at the peak of a tall mountain. It was early in the morning and the clouds had come down from the sky, so nothing below or behind them could be seen. But as they stood at the very peak of a mountain, the place was brightly lit up by the morning sun already. It's not the possibility of Tai Lung running away that bothers me so. It's the fact that we are giving him time to prepare for us. PFTT so what? You afraid that it would cost us more soldiers than we thought? Master White Tiger scoffed. He only receives the side eye from the turtle monk. He cannot win. Master White Tiger said after a long stretch of silence. Why not? He thinned his lips before he answered in a solemn voice, because that would make him invincible. And no one is invincible in this world. Not even Master Ugwe. Okay. The turtle monk nodded before turning away. They stood on top of the mountain for some time, basking in the morning sun, until Master White Tiger's ears twitched. He turned his head to look behind him, and then something flashed above them. The speed at which the thing moved was so fast that it was not visible to the eye. It was almost like a phantom, but the proof of its existence came long after it had passed. A violent whirlwind came to life as it blew a shockwave everywhere. The clouds below them quickly dispersed due to the raid change in wind. After the clouds were gone, the ground below was finally revealed. A nigh-infinite amount of soldiers stretched until the eye could see. They were like ants in an anthill, as their presence disrupts the very balance of nature itself. 200,000 soldiers were slowly marching towards Gong Men under the morning sun. Two more days, Master White Tiger mutters as he looks down at the army. At long last, he will finally be able to slay Tai Lung. Let us go, we cannot leave everything to Master Sloth after all. Turtle Monk said before he leapt into the air and fell towards the army below. The enemy draws near. Tai Lung's POV the sun breathing. It was a technique, a form of martial arts which I copied from the world of Demon Slayer. The main concept behind this enhancing technique was as the name implied. Using a unique pattern of breathing to make sure that you get the most amount of oxygen into your system, thereby increasing the limit of your body. Not only that, but after years of training the user can develop his own set of forms using his breathing technique and true masters have shown other extraordinary abilities using this breathing style. I said it before but after I copied this technique, I realized that it worked extremely effectively for my biology as I had a stronger set of lungs than that of a human. Lungs which were meant to survive in freezing cold and high altitudes where oxygen was scarce. But even then, the enhancement the sun breathing gave me was almost negligible, as I could achieve the same thing by strengthening my body with chi the greatest boon the technique gave me was when it came to endurance which is why you would see me use it during wars or drawn out battles. It was a great technique which can give me more stamina and also enhance my body at a cheaper cost than just using a shit ton of chi but still, it was never a technique on the level of a trump card like flash steps, thunderclap or internal destruction. Well, that changed after I was finally able to master Qi, the first set of techniques I learned after I mastered Qi was the ability to bend elements. I took inspiration from the world of Avatar with these techniques. I was able to achieve similar feats as the benders from Avatar but, expectedly, I was not as good as them and it would take me some time to get on their level. 
But nevertheless, being able to control elements no matter the degree of mastery was great, so I was happy with my achievement. Even if I wouldn't be able to use it in a real fight soon. Well, that changed soon after the new discovery I made during my training these two passing day. Elemental bending, in specific fire bending, and the sun breathing went extremely well with each other to the point that together, they become usable in a real fight. It was the second time it happened where I was able to merge two techniques from different worlds. The first time was when I mixed, bleach, shuinpa, and UQ holder, flash steps to create a new variation of movement I called flash steps which takes the best of both techniques. Now it happened again. Sun breathing by itself was not much, and I had not trained enough to master fire bending to be able to use it in a real fight. But together, I was able to achieve a level of fire bending which I can only compare to the likes of Azula since my flames were also blue. I guess it made sense since even in the original Avatar, it was stated that the power of fire bending comes from the breath and not muscles. And sun breathing seemed to have been created with the sole intention of boosting a fire bender's ability. The feats I was able to achieve when I used both of these techniques together were, in the mildest word, insane. Ooh, ooh. I realized a hot breath that produced smoke from my mouth as I concentrated on my sun breathing. A searing heat was emanating from my body. The surrounding temperature was hot enough to slowly melt the ground under me as waves of heat blew out like the wind. I sat with a crossed leg in a meditation position as I tried to mix the sun breathing with my bending ability. I had ignored progress in other elements and focused only on fire these passing days. Ha! I released the budding energy inside me and my chi turned into flames as it exploded out from my body like a wave, scorching my surroundings. I was sure my current situation would look extremely similar to some main character in a Chinese novel who was cultivating in the ways of the Phoenix Heavenly Fire God. But who can blame me? I am Chinese, so sue me. I laughed at my own thoughts as I relaxed my breathing. I was still using constant sun breathing but it was mellowed out. It's done. I am ready, I said to myself before I stood up. Furthermore, I was currently in one of the mountains that surrounded Gongmen City like a natural fortification. Not only that, but I had ordered my army to march ahead and go beyond the Peel Lake but I stayed behind to get my last training in. But now I am ready. Boom! The ground below me exploded violently as I blasted towards the sky like a rocket. Then I headed north to quickly catch my army, which had marched ahead of me. They should not be meeting with the enemy army yet so I was not late, I was right on time. It took me less than an hour to reach my army, as I covered what it took two days and minutes. My army below looked up in awe as I flew above them. I flew to the forefront of the army and landed with a controlled explosion. Report, they are 50 miles to the north. They have not made a move yet as they take their time to rest before the real battle begins. One of the wolf commanders said to me immediately after I landed. I hummed in acknowledgement while I looked around at our to-be battlefield. The commanders had put up a defensive line just as I had instructed. My army stood its ground in a wide valley surrounded by tall mountains, as if it were a natural alley. Multiple cannons and their handler gorillas were also situated at the side of the mountain, so that they could rain down destruction upon our enemies. The valley was wide enough that we didn't have to fear landslides, and our army could fit perfectly without anyone getting in the way of each other. But for the enemy which would be 200,000 in number, it was too small. This would force them to attack us from the front with limited numbers instead of taking advantage of their number and surrounding us. This is good. I said with a satisfied nod. You did well, Alpha. The commander nodded with a small smile on his face. I like him, as he was one of the few who held genuine admiration for me even before I allied with Shin. I even gave him the nickname Alpha because I like him and his original name was a mouthful. He was also a Kung Fu practitioner and one of the strongest soldiers in the army currently. I noticed him when I trained the army and immediately made him a commander even though he was quite young. He was only as old as Tigris and Pu. Thank you, General, he said with a bow. The place was filled with the presence of my army, but it was not too loud to make sure it did not become disrespectful to me. The army consisted of wolves, foxes, gorillas, and some big herbivores. I was currently at the far forefront of the army, and they were making small camps and huddled in groups behind them. They were chatting with each other, motivating each other, and sharing courage. They wondered if they would survive to see the victory of this battle, and even if they didn't, they asked their friends to do this and that for them. All the while, they sharpened their weapons and fixed their armor. Master Ox and Master Croc, I called out in a voice that held a certain edge. Both of them were doing their best to hide from me but after I called them, they came out from amongst the masses and presented themselves before me. General Tai Lung, they addressed me and bowed down. I dealt with the two of them two days ago after I was done with Gazelle. I revealed to them that I had known about their betrayal long ago and that I couldn't trust them. I put them in Gongmen jail with Gazelle but they broke out of prison the same night as we were lacking sufficient guard in prison to hold two Kung Fu masters. But unlike what you would expect, instead of running away they came to me and got on their knees before asking me to allow them to protect the city which they had sworn to protect. 
They felt betrayed that the people they were helping sought destruction and control over Gongmen City, and they also felt guilty for inviting a disaster to the city. It was like a father bearing a deep desire to protect their child. It was their heavenly duty to protect it, and not doing so would be the same as destroying their honor. In the end, I allowed them to fight in the war since they were strong and I could sympathize with them as a fellow master. So I allowed them one last battle before we decided what fate should befall them. I grant them permission to protect their honor and city. The two of you will not fight with the rest of the soldiers. I told them and pointed at the mountains. You will go through this mountain and wait for the enemy masters. There is no need to waste your energy on the common soldiers. That's what they want us to do. You two will keep the masters occupied until I deal with the big shots. Although this was a war, victory would be decided on who wins the fight between me and whoever they sent to fight against me. We all have the power to turn the tide of the battle alone, so the outcome of the battle directly depends on our fight. I just hope that my soldiers can hold the enemy until I grasp victory in my hand. As you command, Master Croc said while the one-horned bull huffed. After that, we wait. But it was not a long wait as the sun finally sat on the west sky. Signifying noon, our enemy had reached us. The ground under our feet trembled as if a constant earthquake had cursed the world. The presence of 200,000 soldiers should not be underestimated, as I felt the air grow hot and heavy with just their presence. When they finally entered the valley, the sight was despairing as it tested the walls of courage my soldiers had built up for three days. And I felt their courage and morale crumble when the enemy soldiers started beating their shields and armor as they chanted. Hail to the Allied Kingdom! Hail to the Allied Kingdom! Victory to the Allied Forces! Long live the Three Kingdoms! It was like thunder in the sky as their voices and steps shook the world. I could feel how my soldiers held their breath as one question loomed over their hearts. Can we really win this? Can we even survive? Doubts at a time like these could easily lead to defeat. I smiled as my eyes covered the distance between me and the enemy general. I locked eyes with Master Sloth, who revealed a lazy smile while looking at us. A respectable strategy. Too bad he used it on Tai Lung and his army. Are you not scared, Alpha? I asked the wolf commander beside me, who was still as a rock. As long as you lead us, I don't know what to fear, he said with a cheeky smile. You really believe I can lead you to victory? Or are you just not afraid of death? I am afraid of death, General, very much so. Do you know I have someone waiting for me back in the city? Her family moved out but she decided to stay because, in her words, she knew I will protect her. I want to live as long as she did, so I can protect her and be with her, he said with a stupid smile. Like I said, General, I am not afraid because I stand beside you, he said again. Are you sure it's not the rumors feeding your delusion? Are you really unafraid because I am here? It's not the rumors, my lord. I have seen it with my own eyes. I was born and raised in the kingdom of Chu and when I was a child, I saw you standing against every kingdom and stopping a great war by yourself. You saved me and my family that day and because of that, we had the chance to move to Gongmen and start a new life there, he said and I heard his voice clearly even under the shouting of the enemies. So that was why he was such a fanboy. Flattering. Well, make sure you hold your weapon at all times, I said. I was not blushing but it was close. He took out his sword and gripped it tightly in his hand, showing me that he won't let go. As you command, General, I chuckled at the light exchange we had in front of the despairing enemy. I guess it's time for me to make a move and prove to you that your trust is not misplaced. I said with a smile. On my signal, I said. What signal? You will know. I said before I started walking towards the enemy army by myself. Formation. I heard Alpha scream out as my army got ready for battle. I continued walking towards the enemy as all the eyes from my soldiers stuck on my back. Furthermore, I walked casually as if I was not approaching literally thousands of enemies. Minutes passed and when I was far enough, I raised both of my hand in a T-pose and I sucked in a huge amount of air. My chest expanded to a ridiculous degree as I utilized sun breathing at its utmost potential. Sun breathing and then, fire bending, there is a reason why I have been specifically training these two. The world screamed and the winds ran away as brilliant blue blames erupted out of my body like an angry volcano. Sounds ceased to exist, burned away by my flames and the thundering enemy were shocked to silence. Let the battle begin. Tai Lung's POV silence. The absolute lack of sound when more than 200,000 people occupied the space. Couldn't be put into words just how jarring that scene was. So there was silence. But it had more weight than a million words strung together by a poet. Silence was everything. It was fear. It was courage. It was disbelief. It was worship. It was despair. It was hope. It was the enemy and it was the hero. Then the world cried. It was not exactly a sound, but something high-pitched. It was a vibration you hear with your whole body. Blue flames blinded their sight. They were so bright and hot. They burned their eyes. 
There was no smoke because it burned everything, leaving no residue. The blue flames came from my body as they roared out in the silence of space. There was no other sound, so it became everything. A looming noise, as if they were hundreds of feet underwater. It pressed on their eardrum like a heavy blanket. The enemy army held their breath, and those who were unfortunate enough to breathe had to choke on the searing air, void of oxygen. They suffocated in silence. The reality stilled. The world was forced to bear a miracle. Sound returns only with my permission. I gave one word to the silence as it broke. Burn. I summoned the most destructive element in the world and gave it order. The world was unsilenced and chaos emerged. The screams of the enemy sink with the roaring sound of my flames as it moved towards them like gigantic waves in the ocean. They didn't have time to run. Their legs wouldn't move to avoid the inevitable. They froze before the flames, yet their corpse would never know cold. I drove my arm forward as blue flames rushed out from my body. They shot at my enemy like a giant flamethrower and burned everything without remorse. My fire covered the entire valley as it swallowed the entire frontier of the enemy battalion. Their numbers dwindled at great speed, but so did my chi I wouldn't be able to continue for long, as I still need to fight a war. I needed to conserve as much chi as possible. My fire looked like a second sun as it lit up the valley. I continued my attack for ten whole seconds before I ceased my action. ha -ia. I released a breath and with it, the heat in my body. There was a pause and then there were screams of fear and gasp of shock from the surroundings. What greeted me was the sight of charred land mixed with melted rocks like lava. I did not know how much I killed as their bodies were all reduced to ash but I knew I brought down their number by at least four digits. But the greatest damage I did was on their morale. An evil smile spread across my face when I saw the enemy, who were beating their shield and chanting like a victor not too long ago. They wouldn't stop trembling. A look of horror paints their face, my soldiers on the other hand. Attack! They got my signal. For General Tai Lung. For Gongmin City. My soldiers who were outnumbered a hundred to one came charging at the enemy, as if they had all the advantage in the world. Their hopes have been reignited. Their walls of courage strengthened. Ha 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 ha. I started laughing and I locked eyes with Master Sloth. Their formation was in absolute shambles. The soldiers were too stunned and scared to move properly. The least affected soldiers were still shaking too much to even wield their weapons properly. I released a roar and cracked my neck before I got down on all fours. Then I shot towards my enemy. My soldiers followed right behind me as a giant explosion erupted from the back. Multiple red streaks shot across the sky and landed to the back formation of the opposing army. There were explosions which sowed chaos amongst themselves. They ran. The 200,000 soldiers started running from the enemy, 100th their number. Leaving so soon, I roared out and broke through their numbers, taking down the nearest soldiers I could find. I used flash steps to move through the army as their body flew up into the sky as if a train had run through them. Remember, you guys are the one who invaded, I said to one leopard soldier as I held him by the neck. Then my soldiers finally reached the enemy and slaughter ensued. This was just the start. Their numbers were too much to be defeated just like that but for all it's worth, we won the first battle. Kill them all. For Gong Men City. For the Supreme General. Like always, war was a violent chaos. Third POV, we are losing, Master Sloth said with a tinge of disbelief. He was expecting this, or should he say he was expecting the unexpected when it came to Tai Lung. But the scene he just witnessed was beyond just the unexpected. It was a true miracle. No one in the history of Kung Fu was able to summon and control elements like that. It was the first in the history of animal kind. Not to mention Tai Lung's brilliant command over his soldiers the way he boosts their morale, and most impressively the way he set up the position of his soldiers in the valley. It was breathtaking. It was something that would take a fellow general to truly appreciate. We need to retreat for now and launch an attack after we recovered mentally. Otherwise, we are just pigs waiting to be slaughtered, Master Sloth said and was about to announce an official order to retreat to his fleeing soldiers but he was stopped. There will be no need. He is almost ready. A commander from the kingdom of Nanjiao said, objecting to Master Sloth's decision. Master Sloth bit his lips. Whether if they were his soldiers or not, he never liked seeing people die but he knew he could not do anything else. It's all or nothing. Then we need to start moving. We save as many soldiers as possible. Go! Master Sloth ordered and the different masters which were in the middle of the army shot out to fight in the front lines. These masters were shortly stopped by Master Ox and Master Croc before they could change the tide of battle, though. Hey! Where are you going? Turtle Monk screamed at Master White Tiger, who was slowly walking away from them. We were told to stay here until Master Eagle makes his move. I don't freaking care. White Tiger screamed and bared his fangs. His eyes were red in anger as he gazed towards Tai Lung. The bastard had gotten this strong. Huh? The image of the past where Tai Lung defeated him appeared in his mind and it made him more agitated. 
All of his soldiers who were on the front lines and died were fresh in his mind. He was angry. Tai Lung is mine, he said and using a movement technique he shot towards Tai Lung. The battle between two supreme felines. The strongest warrior and guardian of Dali versus the 11th power and the walking kingdom. White tiger versus Tai Lung. Start. Tai Lung's POV. I stood on of a small pile of bodies, which was on top of a small boulder, as I looked down at the battlefield with a satisfied smile. My soldiers were winning as the enemy had given their back out of fear. It was not hard to cut down enemies who had no courage to face you. I had stopped fighting after taking out the initial soldiers as I needed to conserve Chi, especially after pulling off a big move like I just did. I did not know what the enemy was planning so I had to be ready for everything. Besides, my effort would be better placed to change the tide of the war rather than to double down when we were already winning. The war continued on as the battle cry and the frequent explosion of cannons filled the valley. I was sure the ground was shaking too, although I was standing in an elevation so I couldn't feel it. I saw how they tried to send their kung fu masters to the front lines to change the tide of the battle, but just like I had instructed, Master Ox and Master Croc came down from the mountain and stopped them. They were kung fu masters, sure, but they were not even strong enough for me to remember their names. That meant each of them was weaker than one of the Furious Five, so even if there were eight of them, I knew Master Ox and Croc would be able to handle them. Push ahead. My soldiers. I roared from behind, giving more motivation and ferocity to my soldiers, and it also worked to frighten the enemy as they were reminded of my despairing presence. It's like two children sparring in the presence of one parent. The kid without a parent would never even be able to muster enough aggression to give a proper fight. Everything was going well, until it was not. Vuo-o-wum. Eh? Screams, but this time they drilled into my ears because they were from my soldiers. The wolves fighting at the front lines got their body thrown in the air and before they hit the ground, their bodies were cut into multiple places as a whirlwind swept past them. The scene looked oddly similar to how I ran through the front lines not too long ago. If a master was to look at both scenes, they would be able to tell that both of them were executed in a shockingly similar manner. It was almost the exact same style of fighting and technique. Tai Lung. I heard an angry roar. I registered the wrath in the voice but I was stuck in its familiarity instead. A white blur like the wind. I could feel how it flew right at me, destroying and knocking away anything between us, as its aim stayed true. A heavy, malicious intent grasps the air with its cold hands. Now my sense tickled. Something deep in my bones which once guided my ancestor away from danger. It screamed, run or fight. A thin sound, sharp and high-pitched, entered my sensitive ears as I saw black claws slicing the air and coming at me. I pushed out my own claws and swiped up, slicing the space between us as two sets of claws met in a spark of razor clash. The place grew quiet before a shockwave erupted from us, blowing out waves of dust. My enemy stayed stagnant in the air, pushing himself up against my hand as I locked my arm by tightening my muscles. I was not going to move an inch. It's been a long time by who? I said with an evil smirk as I looked at the tiger in front of me. Master White Tiger of Dali. You should have stayed in prison, he said in an icy cold voice, and then we moved. Our image blurred as we met in a continuous clash that the normal soldier could not even comprehend. We left a crater of destruction and many things were cut or sliced apart as we fought in different places. The continuous spark created when our claws would meet was proof of our clash. It was also like fireworks as we danced around the battlefield and slowly moved away from the main army. He was extremely fast. He was probably as fast as I was before being imprisoned by Ugwe. In the end, after our 211th clash, we separated from each other and came to a silent agreement for a break. We both landed away from one another. A good 20 meters of distance was between us and we faced each other. Nice to meet you, too, I said with a small chuckle as I blew on my right claw, which was glowing bright red due to the heat caused by the friction of our clash. Instead of greeting me back, he crossed his arms and with a condescending look, he said, you have not made any improvement. Those were big words coming from a Walmart Tai Lung. But it's still enough to put you in your place, no? I asked. We were talking about the Dragon Claw technique, which was a style of Kung Fu we both practiced. It was also one of my main fighting styles besides my Leopard Kung Fu. Long ago, we used to be rivals as fellow practitioners of the Dragon Claw Kung Fu. But after a short amount of time, it became obvious who was the once-in-a-million genius, as I left him in the dust. While he dedicated his life to that one specific Kung Fu, I went ahead of him and mastered every kung fu. I wouldn't be so sure, he said with a disdainful smile before crouching down. I immediately recognized his posture and a small smile tugged my lips while I crouched down too. It was a traditional challenge from one dragon claw practitioner to another. It was almost like a cowboy gun duel. One attack will decide the winner. Give me your best, I said softly and mockingly. As an old rival, I decided to give him a chance and humor him. We exploded out from our position. 
The earth caved in under our strength as we shot at each other like the wildest tempest. I limited myself to not using chi as I utilized only the dragon clue technique. We cut through everything which resisted our approach towards each other. The wind became blades in the wake of our cache, as gnawing slash marks appeared everywhere. The ten claws in our hands turned into swords as we split apart every matter that stood our way, including each other. It was so fast that there was no sound until we both appeared in each other places. I stood at the place he once at and he did the same. We waited. Then reality finally caught up with us and a loud booming cry split the earth and sky. Boom! A deep silence followed the most violent exchange of the war. It was the calm after the storm. Master White Tiger was the first to stand up and there were multiple small cuts on his body. Small streams of blood painted his white fur crimson but there were no serious injuries. I was still crouching down not because I did not want to, but because I couldn't. You've changed, I said in an eerie, monotonous tone. Then small cuts also appeared on my body, painting my fur red. But unlike him, there was also a deeper wound right at my left chest. But that was not the only part where the difference between us ended. If you look closely, my wounds were bleeding more and there were small dark blood vessels popping out around them, especially on the huge claw mark on my chest. It was poison. Now I knew why my instincts were screaming at me that much when I could beat him easily. It explained why I felt a sense of threat even though I was stronger. He coated his claws with poison. Really? How could he? That posture, that challenge. It was meant to be respected with dignity. He had dedicated his whole life to this kung fu. It was baffling how he could show such disrespect when even I, myself, showed him courtesy by accepting his challenge. You lost your honor. Like I said before, you should have stayed in prison. He said and looked at me. Now please die, Tai Lung. Tai Lung's POV I am strongest. That was no illusion. Nor was it an exaggeration. But was I invincible? Was I undefeatable? Seeing myself completely paralyzed and poisoned through underhanded means by the enemy I respected more than hate. The answer to that question slowly appeared in my mind. Now please die, Tai Lung. His words echoed in the inner cavity of my ears. My body which was completely still and paralyzed gave weight to his words. They felt like hammers. Yes. A pebble should not tell a mountain to move. I said with a smile as I pulled at my blue chi, which was at the innermost part of my being. It was something I said to Shurfu a few days ago. Chapter 66. You can't only have destruction. Sometimes you also need to heal and give life. During the week I spent training in the Jade Palace, I did more than just train my usage of chi to cause massive destruction. I also learned how to use chi to heal myself and others because the last thing I wanted was to have to watch the people I care about die in my hands or be killed by a petty poison. I let my blue chi, which was more responsive to healing techniques than my white chi, flow through my body and heal the damage the poison had done to me. Furthermore, I did not know how the healing techniques worked as that was something most stories never delve into in my past life, but I just imagined my cells working faster and giving birth to new cells and strengthening my immune system to fight against the poison. The fact that I didn't have much clue about how healing works did not matter, as I used a massive amount of chi to make up for it. My body started releasing steam as my temperature rose sharply. My wounds started disappearing at a visible speed. I regained the ability to move my body again as I slowly stood up and cracked my neck. I could feel the astonished gaze of Master White Tiger on my back. Hmm. I wondered out loud as I felt something come up from my throat. Spat, I spat out a thick dark liquid which smelt like blood but also something else. Hee hee ha ha ha. I started laughing and turned to face Master White Tiger. The reason I accepted his challenge and humored him was that I was strong. I knew whatever trick he could pull up from his sleeves, it mattered not to me. I was too strong now and Chi was too versatile. In a way, I was happy that he did such things to me. The Allied Kingdoms were dishonorable as they kept the invasion a secret as long as they could. They did not declare a battle against us, nor did they announce their alliance. They have broken the codes of war. Furthermore, they have broken their honor. But I held the kings responsible for that and thought at least the warriors and master were different, simply following the order of their king, but now I knew they were not honorable either. So why hold back? Whoosh! I used flash steps to reach him at a speed he had never witnessed before. It was too fast that his mind didn't even have time to register if it was real or an imagination. You have eyes but you do not see MT Tai, I said when I was in front of him. A joke. That was the last words I offered him before I plunged my hand through his chest, effectively destroying his heart. His body froze without a heartbeat. His eyes shook and widened to the limit as he locked his gaze with mine. Then everything turned bright blue in his vision as I used fire bending and burned his body. In a matter of seconds, his body turned into ash and was carried away by the winds of the battle. He would not even have a proper grave by which his loved ones could remember him. The champion of Dali, the guardian of the great city, Master White Tiger. He died just like that, his death unhonored, because that was how he lived. I shifted in my position and turned towards the battlefield again. 
My soldiers were still winning, as only a few hours had passed. The valley made it so that the soldiers engaging in combat were always the same, and the only difference was that the enemy had plenty of replacements for the dead. So they had nigh unlimited stamina. So although we were winning right now, I knew we would lose in a drawn-out battle. I needed to do something about that. I told him the consequences of doing such things would be heavy. I heard a voice from behind me and I turned to look at the person who was able to nearly sneak up on me. The turtle monk. He was the eternal kung fu master of Tang, whose age was unknown. He was a monk who rarely got into conflict through the years, and was said to be a relative of Ugwe himself. But unlike Ugwe who was old and wrinkly, the turtle monk was a massive and muscular guy with wide shoulders and huge arms. He was also gray in color and he wore a big green necklace. But I am surprised you were able to shrug off the poison I made so easily. You have come further in mastering Chi than I could have ever expected. He said in a calm voice but rather than his words, I was more focused on what he was doing. He was waving his hand around in the air, as if he were catching something even though there was nothing there. But if you looked closely, you could tell that he was using a slight wind manipulation and he was grabbing tiny ashes in the air and putting them inside his wine bottle. It was the remaining ashes of White Tiger. My blue flames never leave ashes and completely burned any fuel but it seemed I missed some. I wouldn't do that if I was you, I told him in a flat tone, yet it promised something if not followed, something not too pretty. I had bestowed White Tiger the punishment of not even having a proper grave, he would not defy me. Why not? He asked me and continued catching ashes in the air before putting them inside his bottle. Why must one act dictate the value of a life lived? He was just doing what he should, trying his best for the people. I scoffed. Tell that to Ugwe in the spirit realm. Now I won't ask again. I said and turned my body towards him, readying myself to take action. He stopped, right? He said and ceased his action of catching the ashes. He tucked his bottle at the side of his belt and he breathed loudly and slowly as I looked at the odd turtle. I felt no malicious intent for him. Forget about seeing me as an enemy. He didn't even see me as an opponent. And he was also extremely calm around me. He did not fear me. He did not fear the worst thing I could give him. He did not fear death. How odd. I had come across very few who did not fear death. He was one of them. I wouldn't focus on fighting an old turtle if I was you. He said suddenly, right before I was going to lunge at him. I believe you have more pressing matters. What do you mean? I asked. He stayed silent for a while. He's here. The hell? Who is? What do yo dash? My words evaporated in my throat as I snapped my head to look behind me. I did not even pay heed to the turtle monk who sneaked away and went into hiding after that, because there was something gravely wrong about reality. I looked at the direction of the opposing army, and I looked further behind them and into the endless expanse of the horizon. I did not even have time to doubt as that feeling grew bigger and bigger in my chest. It started in my heart, then my stomach, until my whole body was filled with a deep sense of unease. Instincts I had honed for years and some I did not even know about started crying out, screaming at me. This was different from when I first engaged with White Tiger. This was something much worse. What is this? I asked myself when I felt the unfamiliar emotion in my chest. Then I finally realized that something was approaching the battlefield. It was fast, too fast that I could not see it nor sense it with my chi. What was it? I wondered. Couldn't have been artificial. Was it a meteorite? There was no sound. There was no object. And there was no telling as it moved at a speed far incomprehensible to me. It felt like I was trying to sense light itself with how fast it was moving. But then, in a split second, everything changed again. I felt intention, I felt bloodlust. The thing was an animal. No, an enemy. Everyone run. I managed to scream out to my soldiers, but then it reached us. It was impossibly fast. Its speed seemed to ridicule the very law of space itself. I was not sure what happened next because there was no sound and I couldn't see it. The world cried out in despair and the most violent shockwave and tornado descended on the earth. Mountains were cleaved. Then I finally found out what the feeling in my chest was. It has been so long since I felt that emotion so I had nearly forgotten it. Fear. Boom boom. Third POV. What's the fastest animal in the modern world? The obvious answer which popped into the average mind might be a gazelle or a cheetah. But those are not the correct answer. The fastest animal in the world was a bird. The peregrine falcon. That was the name of the fastest animal in the world. It could easily reach up to the speed of 390 kilometers per hour. Around four times faster than that of a cheetah. How does a simple bird reach such frightening speed? The answer lies in the body and the technique that the peregrine falcon possessed. It would fly up high in the sky before it tucked its wings and dived like a missile. Its body was streamlined and perfectly designed to cut through the air with ease. Its powerful wings propel it faster and faster as it plunges towards the earth. Its feathers were stiff to reduce drag, and the bird used gravity to its favor to get the ferocious speed that it was known for. The bird used this technique to hunt its prey, 
which consists mostly of ducks and pigeons. Diving at such speed, its prey would get their head chopped off even before they realized they were being hunted by the fastest animal in the world. Now, in this world of Kung Fu and Qi, there was one person who used the same technique as the fastest animal in the modern world. His name was feared throughout China, and his strength was such that even his own king would never dare order him. Mighty Eagle. To not be mistaken, the renowned eagle merely utilized the same technique as the peregrine falcon. The caliber at which they used the same concept was vastly different. I think I better make a move, Mighty Eagle said with a lighthearted chuckle as he looked down at the battlefield from the mesosphere. His eagle eyes were able to cover the distance of 80 kilometers with ease and watch the battlefield as if he was right above it. After his chuckle died down at the height which most birds had never reached, he started his dive. For reference, a normal bird in the modern world rarely flies higher than the troposphere, which ends at 10 kilometers. But Mighty Eagle was easily staying in the mesosphere, 80 plus km high up the sky. At such insane height, Mighty Eagle began his descent. His powerful wings, a thousand times stronger than the peregrine falcons, flapped multiple times to propel him towards the earth. His body, streamlined and coated with the thinnest layer of chi, made it so that his body felt like it was cutting through empty space. He encounters no drag or resistance in the atmosphere. In just a few seconds, his huge body turned into a blur and he left sound behind. A huge explosion which signifies the breaking of the sound barrier was the last sound the attack made. For the rest of the descent, sound tried effortlessly to catch up to Mighty Eagle. His body did not slow down and his speed did not remain constant. The closer he got to the ground, the faster he got, until the world even failed to register his existence. Chi, which was basically the world itself, had no time to interact with him. It makes him flicker out of reality as his body becomes impossible to sense. For all reality cared, Mighty Eagle no longer existed. When Mighty Eagle was about to reach the ground, he spread out his wings ever so slightly. His wingspan became a deadly blade slicing at a speed incomprehensible to the world. There was no sound. There was no sight. There was no telling. Everything happened, but nothing noticed it. Mighty Eagle flew straight through the valley at that godly speed. But as stated, nothing notices it, so there was no visible effect until the action had long been executed. But when reality finally noticed it and the world catches up, all hell broke loose. Chaos descended upon the world. Boom boom. Mountains were cleaved and bodies were dismantled. Nothing was spared from the destruction that Mighty Eagle had brought down upon the world. But no one heard the explosion and chaos. Because by the time those things caught up, everyone who was meant to be dead was dead. The attack had no name. Because how can you name something which you can neither see nor hear? Even the ones who were lucky enough to survive it did not know what happened and simply thought they had lost their memory of what happened. It was done. Mighty Eagle had proven one of the tiles he was known by. The Vanquisher of Armies. And so, Ugwe wrote in one of his scrolls and Tai Lung read, A new type of Kung Fu that I have never seen before and one that could not be replicated carries no sound nor image for it to be named. It defies the fundamental laws of this universe and thus could not be explained. And so, Mighty Eagle was able to cut down mountains with a flap of his wings, forever carving his name in history as one of the strongest Kung Fu masters that had ever graced China. And that concludes this episode. If you enjoyed it, I'd seriously love it if you guys could leave a like on the video as it genuinely helps out so much, and it keeps me going, plus it takes only one second. That said, have a wonderful day. See you in the next one.